Sure. Uh, hey guys, welcome to the Valley Cast. Uh, we have a very special episode because today we have Roberto Blake. Roberto Blake, everybody. Roberto Blake, Roberto Blake everybody. Blake. Now, yeah, I'll thank laps. you guys for having me. Great to have you, my friend. Now, listen, I just want to address right away on the top of the show. Um, first of all, how the hell do we know each other? Oh, I don't know this. Yeah, <laughs> because like, I always try to figure it out as we go and try to piece it together. And sometimes I'm really wrong, I think. But I imagine fun scenarios. Well, he, it's nice. Here's the thing. Roberto is a presence in the YouTube world and is uh, he's quite a mover and a shaker. And uh, and <laughs> like a maraca, you know, I, and you go to VidCon and you go to these events where you speak and you talk to people and you're a very intelligent man. And uh, and then one day I just know we followed each other and I it must have been after like a VidCon or something. But do you know the story of like, how we... I don't look I, I, to be very honest with you, man, like I meet so many people, like you said, and we go to all these events yes. and everything, Steve. So like I, I don't always remember the origin yeah. story unless it was something hilarious or (laughs) embarrassing or both which i'm usually uh, connected with so i'm hoping there might be some (laughs) i don't i don't have a cool uh, origin story for us and if i had thought about it i would have made one up yeah i just had i did a podcast uh last week with my girlfriend's best friend and they asked on the podcast how we met and i was like oh Dude, I, I don't yeah, know. Yeah, there's no way to know. <laughs> I think it was source vet that I had a wife at the time. It was the most, I was like, this isn't a good answer. <laughs> Which means, Roberto, in the next three years, we'll be having a conversation when you and Elliot are dating. And I, I look forward to it. <laughs> Where's What's your meet cute with Elliot? <laughs> oh, I'll remember this. This I care about. <laughs> so in full transparency, um, there's been a lot of absolutely terrible shit happening in the world with some uh, excellent... Um, activism and progress and, and yeah a lot of great shit too a lot of great yeah, shit that's important to acknowledge you know we talk about the yeah. bad we rarely talk about the good that comes of it and um the good that happens in general in the world mm-hmm. indeed yeah. and it's very important to find a balance you know the yin and yang a little bit because it's yeah. all kind of part of the whole thing and it's an unavoidable andrew thing yang. his name is andrew, andrew yang, yang. <laughs> He's the, <laughs> he is the uh yeah no he is the the good in the world the the, 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 the way, the truth, and the light. Uh, think, yang, yang Yang. Should Andrew Yang have a child named Yin Yin and, so that he can have a son named Yin and Yang? You know, um, like I don't know if uh, I don't know if literally that he can do that without being canceled. I don't think he can do that without You're being right, canceled. I think I don't think he can lean into the meme in that You're case. Right. You know? You're totally I think there's right. a lot. Okay, but I think there's a lot. I'm, okay I'm fine with Andrew Yang getting canceled, but can we elect him president first and then cancel uh, him after his term maybe? <laughs> well, no, I mean if can we can we uh, uh, look, can we cancel him and then elect him president? Can we do I mean, I don't care the order. <laughs> like Yeah, Trump went that order, you're right. At this point, I don't we could also we could also elect a yin and yang can run as vice president and then we'll be voting for yin and yang (laughs) so then we'll be great (laughs) well we've done this joke (laughs) all right right. so so here's the deal for our listeners welcome to the show uh so what we're doing with roberto is is here's here's my thing so all this shit's going on and it's really terrible and then there's good and terrible and it's and it's all anxiety and pressure and sadness and strength (laughs) and all that stuff and um I was going through my Twitter feed and we were planning the next Valley cast and I was like, all right, we're going to we're going to branch out from our friend group, um, which we've which we've been basically living in as far as like the Valley folk goes. We've been really yeah. including a lot of our friends and comedian people that we've worked with. And so I was like, it's time to start branching out and it's time for us to branch out with people of color and amazing people of color and just outside of our friend group but more visibly yeah. for people of color and your name was one of the first ones to pop up in my friends list and i was like this guy i just know him because we followed each other after some vidcon or something and his posts seem cool and he seems very intelligent and he's got quite a resume of speaking and coaching and all sorts of cool stuff and i was like this is the guy i want on the podcast because um we definitely wanted someone that could speak about 
you know, the the other side of, of things happening with the Black Lives Matter movement and and all the, the all of this stuff going on. And we really just wanted to bring someone in that could speak to that without it looking like just three white guys going like, we're angry. You know, and even though I'm Mexican, but you know, whatever. Yeah. We I look like a white sure. guy, and that's the point. Sure, of, you know, I mean, we can talk <laughs> about that at some point too. Like, we, I mean, we, sure, sure. I mean, I I feel like, um, you know, if everybody at home, by the way, is playing Valley Cast Bingo, uh, Steve mentioning he's Mexican, should you should find on the top <laughs> yeah, right? Yeah, that's corner. right up there. Yeah. Well, and Elliot yeah. mentioning his relationship with Grace should be one too. Yeah, <laughs> I mean, we're Grace. just we're just checking off boxes. <laughs> Sorry. Anyway. Here, if you got that center box and it's still open, I'll say it again. I love Meg Turney. I am in love with her. I'm we're gonna I'm gonna leave my wife and we're gonna get married. Check wow. off the box. That, that I mean that I checked that one off before we even started recording. <laughs> um, but anyway, Roberto, we want to just shut up and take a step back and let you kind of take the reins here and not to give you the responsibility to make the show good or anything and that's not what this is about what this is about is you're gonna interview us you're gonna (laughs) yes you're gonna interview us look i'll carry the show i'll carry the show we don't i'm known for taking over other people's (laughs) podcasts so listen if you want to take over that's totally fine you you have full free reign to say and do whatever you want here but i just really think it's important for our audience to know exactly who you are and if you'd like to give people kind of the elevator pitch of of what your role is in the YouTube world and what you do and and uh, and then from there literally this is your stage my friend please okay please utilize. so for for context and I know that most of the audience probably has no idea who I am and that's fine even like when we went to VidCon and stuff like that I always pull the room and more than half the people never have heard of me and that's always great because I'm gonna just make sure that they know afterward right so of course um, <laughs> For, for all the people, for the 99% of people in the audience who don't know who I am, my name is Roberto Blake, and I am a creative entrepreneur. I am a public speaker at events like VidCon, Vid Summit, where I'm an educator in video marketing. I came from a background in traditional marketing, graphic design, advertising. I came from that world. You know, the other side that actually pays uh, the bills for YouTube. And so uh-huh. um, I was on the other side, the enemy camp, you know, um, <laughs> for a number of years. Um, and so I ended up uh, becoming independent, leaving corporate life um, as many are wont to do, uh, but I made it work. I became entrepreneurial through freelancing, which I had a background in anyway, um, doing the moonlighting thing that more and more people are doing today as we go through the horrible economic carnage, displacing jobs. It's like, you know, so even back then I knew I had a lot to offer. I feel even more so strongly about that now having gone from being someone who in their teenage years, you know, worked at the mall $6 an hour to being a multiple six-figure entrepreneur, doing it as a creative person, the thing you're told your whole life, you'll end up in a cardboard box, you'll end up poor, don't do that, do a steady job, do this, do that. I even in my corporate life got to be a creative, but it was so restrictive and it was so frustrating to not have creative control, creative freedom, to be held back by people, and sometimes not to believe in what the company is doing to where I had to go my own way and I was willing to take the risk of failing and take the risk of making less money to just be goddamn happier. And the result was I got to build a brand that I care about, get to move from freelancing and living hand to mouth that way, but making good money to building a more sustainable business around my creativity and my brand, getting to empower and educate and help people with the fundamentals of skill development. You can get a good job like I did, even if you don't want to be an entrepreneur, if you have the skills to monetize your creativity by creating value the market wants. And that is right now, software is the game. Learning a software, mastering a software and mastering a service provider niche is the game for entry level to people to get good jobs now that will not be displaced in the near future. You want to master Mm -hmm. a good uh, software speed, something technical and something that you can skill up and that's something that can transfer across multiple industries, okay? Something maybe tied to software that helps drive sales or marketing in some capacity, okay? Something kind of future proof is what you're saying. Something much more future proof, exactly. And one thing that we all know is relatively future proof is uh, advertising. And as content creators, uh, we live by and die by the fact that um, advertising and uh, being able to market and to move uh, products and services is a thing 
that will last for time immemorial. Yay, consumerism, right? <laughs> yep. Let's, um, let's all um, worship our new god of consumerism, right? Yay. Yes, um, Disney. I'm being, <laughs> all I'm hail being sarcastic. <laughs> right, all hail, like for real, all hail the Disney empire. Yeah. Um, our, new the, over, uh, our Disney overlords. Yeah, we got to check real quick. Let's yeah. do our daily check. Are we? Do they own us yet? Are we there? <laughs> Are we there yet? Are we there yet? <laughs> um, but no. Um, so I, I, you know, I got into that world um, and I, what I did with YouTube was as a freelancer, um, one, I always wanted to educate people about what I do and how to do it. And I wanted to give more people like, Hey, if you're like me, even if you can't afford to go to a good school or a good college, the good news is you can learn software. And if somebody shows you how you, you can make a good living from it. And if you can't go to college, I'm going to just show you how I did it. And you're going to learn it the way that I know it. Because sometimes the people who taught me, they couldn't teach it away. I had to teach myself or reteach myself because they weren't able to connect the dots for me. So I did that. I did a bunch of tutorials on that stuff on YouTube for a number of years, branched out into some other things. I taught software, photography, design skills, marketing. And then um, because I was growing on YouTube, one a couple of things happened. Uh, one, clients hiring me for creative services work started hiring me to do their marketing. So I got to move from freelancing into consulting uh, for a lot oh, of my fun. clients. Then I started picking up more contacts and then getting more involved in the industry. And then with my YouTube presence and me um, doing that off the tutorials, people in my audience were like, how are you growing your YouTube channel? So I was like, do you want me to make a video about it? And they're like, yes, please. It's like, all right, here's the camera gear I use. Here's the lighting I use. Here's the thing. I started with the technical stuff. Then I was like, all right, well, here's my strategies. Here's, I learned SEO in corporate. Here's how you use it in YouTube. I learned it for Google. Google owns YouTube. That was for me. Oh, that's for me. Connect the dots. It's like, okay, here's all the things you don't know about SEO. Roberto, how do you fix our channel? <laughs> you know, what are we, we doing can, wrong? You know, well, tell well, us everything. We're supposed to talk warm about them that. up first, Elliot. We can talk, <laughs> like, I know, look, but I got excited. No, we can talk about that at some point, but you guys aren't an SEO driven channel. Like, you guys are a personality driven channel, and you guys are also a topic driven channel. So there's gonna be inconsistencies and you guys know this, you already know that sometimes the inconsistencies are uh, for you guys are gonna be very topical driven. It's the same thing for education channels, by the way, if education channels don't stick to an exclusive thing or right. if it's not pop science. But I will tell you this, here's something that you guys and anybody can do is if it's packaged in such a way that a 10 year old can grasp the concept, it'll be successful. Just ask Mr. Beast. Yeah, that's true. I was talking to a friend of mine and we, we really get into these deep rabbit holes of like, how do we do that? What's with our thumbnails and how do we do like what, what's going to work? And, and uh, it's interesting when you talk about how, especially now it seems like YouTube is really, it really favors the algorithm really favors Cons this consistent thing that just explains what your channel is and it doesn't deviate from that. Well, the thing is humans are that, and that's even, right. even some of our problems. Our problems are all predicated in the oversimplifications that we do in human behavior down to black and white thinking, binary thinking, uh, because that's a very rigid uh, decision-making rubric. And when you look at YouTube and its algorithm, YouTube is just a responsive system. And the thing is, a lot of things in our society are responsive systems. It's about the inputs. And so the thing is, um, it's down to here's what human behavior is, and the system reflects what that human behavior is. And the right. changes you guys think happen in the algorithm just are changes that happen in human cultural dynamics yeah. and the zeitgeist of how we behave as a society. Wow, the social construct, <laughs> The social construct bleeds into what the era that you guys started in YouTube was. YouTube was a magical place back when you guys started because it was this magical place of the exiles, the creatives, the nerds, the artists, and everything like that. It was very yeah, it high-minded, high but it was also very insular. And everybody knew everybody. Sometimes you want to go where everybody <laughs> knows your name that's the old youtube community that's pre-2012 but when the money came in and anybody could monetize it became for normies and then it started not to reflect what you guys would call the true youtube community that extended into normal society and it has permeated for the last eight years which means the youtube community has been more open than closed in its entire history of 15 years now which means what the community the community you guys came up with it it exists in the form of og youtubers they're still around and og people who grew up with youtube they're still in the culture but it is not the majority of the two billion logged in users 
who don't really even fully grasp what a YouTuber is and just use it as an alternative or extension of regular media and has the scale to where it's not alternative media anymore. It's, it's mainstream media. It's just digital mm -hmm. first. Yeah. Well, and to clarify, too, just to give credit where credit is due, I think Joe Beretta might be technically the only OG YouTuber because... It was the money that came in that got me and Steve uh, <laughs> into that system, I think. We were, that was when they were like, Google was like, we're going to give all this money away. And then me and Steve got careers out of it. So. You guys oh, got so jobs. The, the, YouTube, um, the YouTube One initiative, I think, is what that That's was. Yes, one. sir. That's... Yeah, we're like, the, we're like the middle children of, uh, yeah. of YouTube. Like, not quite old school, but definitely not these days. Source well, comparatively uh, now, you guys are still considered old school because you guys are still like um, Pokemon Generation 2 or 3. <laughs> <laughs> sure. We get the sexy in. Pokemon, the ones that are considered the sexy ones. We haven't uh, reached our full evolution yet. This isn't our final <laughs> form. But it's right interesting on. that you mentioned that um, you know the zeitgeist and how how the collective consciousness changes and the algorithm. Um, it kind of uh, evolves. we are the algorithm. We are the algorithm, are. and it evolves around that. And it's so funny because when I think about us planning to create the Valley Folk. The whole idea for us was to just, you know, reunite, obviously, as old friends, but also to just kind of create this variety show channel where we just did sketches and and uh, couch videos and vlogs and all this stuff. And it's like we really got excited about that idea because it kind of showcases what we're all good at each in our own ways. But then it turned out that, like, but that's not how you succeed. You know, you don't not succeed. anymore because as you expand, that works for a creative consumer that's a creative fluid mind, which is the community you guys came from is where somebody that is uh, much more high frequency uh, can appreciate that right. versus the average consumer is much more. I came for this. Give me that. Right. Like there's it's like so for a YouTube channel unless it's driven by a story narrative early on and if it goes viral that especially helps like story driven personality creators like um rob kenny with the dad how do i channel that just exploded um you know um kelly stamps emma chamberlain and uh mm -hmm. janelle iliana these are uh creators whose personality and stories drive um and even the the story of going viral drives their narrative and then you invest for that and then the loyalty meta -narrative. is predicated huh meta narrative yes the meta narrative and then it's uh, even mr beast it's that now the thing is the story is driving it pewdiepie himself is a meta narrative like that is so the thing is if you can create your own meta culture that is the essence of being a personality driven channel and the thing is that was easier in the early days of youtube when the community itself was entirely meta Creating an, 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 mm. an, a meta culture in the current um, broad diversity and diaspora of who a YouTube viewer is now, with all the unlimited options of content, people narrow in as, I want this for this, and this for this, and this for that, and everything like that. Now, here's what I would say. That's a matter of packaging, though, not a matter of the delivery. Variety, I think, can exist in a show format where you're coming for that show mm -hmm. and then individual standalone pieces i think lend themselves where to a clip well to eclipse channel because you're the the value proposition of that is variety and packaged as such and i know this because my friend i don't know if you guys ever watched front page tech mm -mm. Mm -mm. so my friend john nope. prosher has a comedy tech news show that i think is very much in the spirit of like what source fed was back in the day but it's the tech niche but it's really a comedy skit show where he pulls headlines from the verge and all these tech um, outlets and then satirizes it while also reporting on the relevant uh points and being very opinion and personality driven wow that's great so but the thing is he was struggling just two years ago as a small youtuber and floundering and almost even ready to actually not two years ago sorry uh three or four years ago um, and floundering and ready to give up and like he's explosive now and like gets like a hundred thousand plus views and upload when he was struggling to get three thousand views and upload before just a short while ago and he'd been doing it prior to that for like six years prior to that wow. and struggling yeah. and the explosive growth didn't come just because of like any kind of virality but it's like he was able to sustain growth when i told him john you keep doing three different types of programming 
just do the funny tech news show with bad jokes and a load of personality. Package only that, but make whatever you want. But package it as the single value proposition that people uh, sign up for because their their minds can only handle like the the right. one idea, the one most people cannot handle broad concepts or extractions or vira- uh, variety. They need to know. I just want a Coke. I don't. I don't want a. I don't want a variety pack. Just oh, let me have my Coke. Yeah, right. Over or it's again, over again. I want to go to the sushi place. It's fine if they have other things on the menu, but it needs to be branded as the sushi place. Right. Yeah, we could. Uh, we'll. D- we can be better. I think about all that, but I like the idea of the single value proposition too. Like just yep. simplifying it mentally to be like, oh yeah, that makes it more palatable for people. It's one of the reasons we started doing our, our. Uh, your show show four times a week was because it was like all right let's let's lean into this one thing that people seem to enjoy and hopefully that'll free us up to to do other things mm-hmm. but but um, then you're talking about the other paths of success on the platform right like mm-hmm. the reason we were a patreon based model is because we didn't want to be slaves to yeah. the we algorithm and we wanted trades, to do yeah. what we wanted and if you're successful on that other platform and mm-hmm. that is bringing you the success that YouTube's not that's a different type of freedom yes now I love that you said that there are different types of freedom yeah Creative so it's freedom like, versus financial freedom yep YouTubers well, get wanna, tracked because they get uh they instead of separating those things they conflate them we it's uh, the poison it's the YouTube poison brain is what I call it mm-hmm. yeah now I don't I don't want to throw too much of a wrench in but if for the sake of brevity can we switch gears for, for I can a little bit I can absolutely switch gears because you got me excited about that. <laughs> yeah, no, it was super, I, was, I was like interested in both, but I was like, ah, I want to I I mean, talk about the other here's thing. Here's the thing. Uh, we could I totally can, use, I got a question. Oh, sure, I got a sure, question. Sure, sure. And I can use oh, it wait. as a segue, by the way, but go ahead. What's your question? Okay. My question, and feel free, Steve, to, to jump in first. My question for you, Roberto, at some point, I just want to know uh, how you doing. Yes. And that's it. <laughs> yes. Um, okay. So I'll actually even start then. I'm being able to talk with you guys and talk with you guys first about this helps reduce some of my own anxiety about all the things we have to talk about. And so it's a Great. good, it was a good warm up. Oh, okay. and we are going to uh, get to that. We're massaging you with a little algorithm before yeah. you, you dive And in. thank you and. because it actually, it actually helps because the chronic stress and trauma of all the things that I've had to see in my feed minute after minute, hour after hour and everything like that has been this like self masochistic flagellation of my brain. And, um, it was reaching a point where it was very bad for my mental health. And, but being able to talk with you guys and laugh and joke and everything like that, even though we're in a very serious time, I think that people need to give themselves permission. And that's why I made my video yesterday is I want to give people permission to not look, not, not that they need to look away. But they need to be mindful of the fact that self-destruction and self-mutilation through um, exposure to trauma has long-term negative mental health consequences that, and people have not been in a position to understand that before, and they need to be thoughtful about it for themselves and for other people. And that's not the same thing as ignoring and turning a blind eye. It's an acknowledgement of the idea that there's capacity for resilience and you might be exceeding it. Mm-hmm. And that's you know, just called uh, abuse. I think that's a real good point and it reminds me of this thing that I saw on Instagram that Zachary Quinto posted. Oh. You remember Zachary Quinto? Yeah, Spa. Mm-hmm. I don't know why. Siler. 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 Oh, Siler. That's course, where I was going. Si- yeah. Uh, <laughs> but he says some are posting on social media, some are protesting in the streets, some are donating silently, some are educating themselves. Some are having tough conversations with friends and family. A revolution has many lanes. Be kind to yourself and to others who are traveling in the same direction. Just keep your foot on the gas. I really like that because I was like, that's a nice reminder that people need to be taking care of themselves amidst this uh, insanity. you got to have a little self-care if you're going to be your best for the fight. For everybody, yeah. yeah. I I agree with that. And uh, it's a part of even my own message because as an entrepreneur and as a YouTube content creator, like there's a there's a meta there's like a meta narrative around the concept of hustle and work ethic and it gets very divisive among other conversations we're having. But people um there's a difference between saying I want and need to make sacrifices now to not continue to sacrifice and die the death of a thousand cuts mm-hmm. and I'm willing to do that, but I'm also willing to accept that your version of that might be different or you may not be there yet and that's fine. But then there's also the fact that there are people who need 
um, productivity in their life and they don't want to. There are people who it's a bad for them to take a week off from work or a, uh, or to go on a beach. People like me, for example, who they have to be guarded in their thoughts and like the amount of idleness that might be really good and relaxing for somebody else is toxic for somebody else because mm-hmm. of the fact that they need the stimulation, they need the outlet, they need that because they have other things going on that you may not be aware of. Like, like one of the worst things you could do for me is tell me to not do th- work for two weeks because I do things that I love and there's a difference. Now, mm-hmm. if I didn't love my work, two weeks off would not me be, if I like when I was in my nine to five job, uh, time off from work was not me just and there's nothing wrong with sleeping if you need the recovery. But like for me, it was like, great, I've got time off from work. I can learn this new thing. Oh, I got time off from work. I can read these books and I can learn this new thing. Oh, I've got time off from work. I can fiddle around with my camera and learn how to get better shots and be like the people that I look up to. I need those things and that's how I use that time. So I love what Zachary Quinto was saying is there's a self-awareness aspect. And the thing is we also, um, it's very hard to judge and we shouldn't be so quick to judge what is right for somebody and what's right yeah. size in their life. It, it, it looks different for, uh, for everybody, I think. And yeah. it's nice to remember that because it's easy because there's so much emotion going around right now. I think that it's difficult to, it's difficult, right? And I think it should be difficult for people to to navigate. But um, keeping an eye on, like you're checking yourself, is always good too. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I mean, it's uh, you, like you said. It's if we don't, we're abusing ourselves. It's not enough to not abuse or hurt mm-hmm. other people. You have to start with you. Mm-hmm. And the thing is, well, hurt people hurt other people, and they continue to hurt themselves. It's this vicious, ridiculous cycle. Mm-hmm. R- mm-hmm. Roberto, and what is your like? process been the past couple weeks with all of this have you found like mostly crying you have a yeah (laughs) is that what it is honestly it's been like i mean i'll be very real with you it's like um it's been every day i've had to like just curl up and cry uh but that's me that's and i'm not Mm -hmm. like but that's what i needed Mm -hmm. yeah i don't think you're alone (laughs) yeah man it's a i mean everyone i'm talking to is talking about this just even uh it just seems like a, a infection of, of this morose kind of sadness, and it's, everyone's just a little bit down. But then that's everyone. That's baseline. I've is probably down. I've that, probably not. multiple times throughout this, literally multiple times, gone through like the stages of grief. Yeah. Really. Mm-hmm. But I like. But for anything challenging, that is for me normal. I mm-hmm. don't think that that might be typical for people who are neurologically typical. But with me. Um, and in context, by the way, I have like ADHD, general anxiety, and I've suffered from depression and suicidal ideation before. So it's like I have a, a different neuro pathway set up in terms of how I process things. And then there's also different things tied to trauma for me that exist in my own experiences and my own memories. So again, that's different. And so um, I know that it's become a meme to use the word triggered, but like people don't understand. And I grew up, um, my father was a soldier and I grew up military. When my parents diver- divorced, we lived in, my dad was a Marine, but ironically we ended up in an army town. Um, and the military brats <laughs> have the context of like why that's interesting. But like, um, you know, uh, but the the thing is when you have to actually experience either for yourself or watch someone have a reaction a triggering moment to where all right psychologically they process something different and it manifests in a very specific way for them it's not a funny meme anymore when you see it play out and um and that's not to take that away from anybody but it's also to give them context that's like it's a joke until it's not and Totally. When you live around the military and you see people and you see what happens and when you have, when you're literally, and it's, this is an interesting, like, this is just a small side story and I don't want to dwell on it, but, like, when you go from a barbecue laughing and drinking with somebody to seeing them on the news two months later, like, that's really hard to reconcile um, and to be dismissive of the idea that we don't all process experiences and input in the same way and that it's that easy of a switch to flip totally totally and i think it got uh 
Oh, sorry. Go ahead. Steve. Well, no, I was just going to say that d different things trigger different people, and and just because something triggers someone else doesn't mean that it's going to trigger you, or maybe it does, or maybe it doesn't. But the thing is, is like you have to understand that if something is truly triggering for someone, then you have to respect what that is, and you have to res respect someone just like you would expect them to respect something that bothers you. You know, but the thing is, like, what you'll find, and this is the problem, is psychologically, and I've started to dabble in this, and no, I'm not um, a, a psychiatrist or a degreed or certified and everything like that, but as a marketer. Yet. Well, and a life coach, <laughs> right? Like, you, you, you've you, certainly Well, done... a business coach. Actually, I'm a business development coach. I'm not a life coach. But, oh, right, right, right. But, it, Sorry, but the thing is, business is some people's lives. So, sure, uh, like, sure. you know, but. But, the, yeah, the, the brain, you're talking about the brain chemistry? Yeah, I mean, the so psychologically, so here's an, an interesting thing that I've come to understand uh, from experience, and I've been articulating to this with, for, with friends who are educated in academic psychology, but I have the application of it as a business person. You know, psycho psychology and business is a very specific thing that marketers and business people, especially online business people, ha are practitioners of. It's just not formal or academic in nature. It's boots on the ground. Um, so in the same way that in selling to people, you eliminate abstractions, I've noticed something very interesting about uh, people who are more or less empathetic. Mm -hmm. People who are less empathetic, I find, tend to be less uh, fluid-minded, and they cannot deal with abstract mm -hmm. thoughts. They deal very much in literalism, mm -hmm. and they deal very much in historionics, and they need tangibles and they are skeptical and objectionable to anything that exists outside of their own scope, scope of experience. You'll find these people tend not to be futurist, they tend not to be artistic or creative in nature, they tend to be very, very much literalist, and they very much are attached to anything that there is a historical reference or proof for, and they're dismissive of anything that they don't have that experience of, even to the point of suggesting it's not real or doesn't exist. Facts. Yeah, it's uh, facts don't care about your feelings. Well, it's not that because that, that is – well, not even that moniker because here's the thing. That I think in a certain context should be explored, and here's my thought on that because the thing is I think outside of that being rhetoric or th feeling aggressive, it's if you examine that consequences exist outside – of your feelings or outside or consequences exist outside of your emotional spectrum or that your emotional spectrum or your feelings don't change natural consequences. Primary example, your good intentions don't change the damage that you might have done to somebody. That's an example I think that's, that's yeah, that's a good version of it, but I my fear is that that um, phrase has been weaponized the same I agree. way that uh, yeah, like how triggered is over, got overused by maybe a little a small subset of people, and then was taken and delegitimized as like an actual thing as a result of it. And now triggered is like in the lexicon. It's kind of yeah, it reminds it's me a of that. Where it's like people it's a people now. use that phrase to justify a lack of empathy because they think that your feelings then are just your own little problem to deal with and aren't like actually informing the world around them. And it's funny, though, because I can use that in reverse against them. I can weaponize it against them because I could say something like, for example, that's like your feeling about your feeling about the um, the fact that there um, someone feeling that what happened to George Floyd doesn't have to do with race and is only about police brutality and only about abuses of power and only that is not reflective of the facts of every black person's experience. It's also probably, if we want to get, I mean, because my whole thing is, I'm real into the psychoanalysis, psychological uh, stuff, but like, in addition to what you're saying, I think there's also an element of, when they're doing that, when they're going, no, this isn't a race issue, this is a police brutality issue, I think on some level they are still being driven by their emotions, which are just deeper-seated. Which is what I was exactly, they're rationalizing. Yeah. They're using, because here's the thing, if we yeah. understand, if we accept, if we accept that we are emotional creatures that figure out a rational impetus to justify whatever it is that we are feeling and intellectualize it, we're better off if we just admit that that's the, the core truth of like, here's how I'm feeling and here is the mental gymnastics that I came up to justify that and I'm going to try to get as many people to accept my justification as possible so that I can hold that up as right. And if it's we just all, yeah. admit that that's what we do, 
It's so, and they, I, it blows my mind because it's like you. I don't trust anybody who says that they don't. Uh, they haven't. Uh, that say they're perfect in any way or say that they're completely free of any flaw. And so when you have people that... Or are like, when they no, try to use the phrase, I'm unbiased. Right. We're so, yeah, <laughs> or, exactly that. Yeah, and they, they start every sentence with that. <laughs> yeah. I use like the this, phrase, I try to be objective or I've tried to look at this from multiple angles and perspectives and here's what I came up with. Like, yeah, that's where I go with it. Exactly, and that's the best you can do. Yeah, but when you have people going, oh, no, 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 this isn't, this is 100% not a race thing it's what and i'm 100 percent not racist it's like who believes that like why would you say that why, why who mm-hmm. just in the art of convincing people how is that a persuasive argument to be like me i'm flawless i wouldn't believe anybody was flawless they're even making they an appeal to, to the concept of authority because this is another psychological yeah. part of business and go, marketing if is is if you speak psychologically with conviction with confidence intent like 90 like i'm just pulling a bullshit number out of my ass but watch this i'll use the example 99% of winning is confidence 99% of winning is winning is confidence every yeah. shot that you every shot that you don't take <laughs> yeah. every shot every single shot that you don't take is a miss you can't win a game you don't play if you're a wallflower and you're Fuck. single why are you complaining and That's see here's right. the thing that's and good. here's the thing. I'm using that. And here's the thing. There's some grain of truth to everything I just said here. But I said it with such conviction and such authority and such this that if I know that I'm speaking to an audience that has less conviction, less authority, and less confidence than me and has less results than me, then I know psychologically that that person is more likely to believe me than to believe themselves. They're more likely to accept that I – what I'm saying – and the thing is if I keep saying oh. a lot of things that are right, if I keep saying a lot of things that are right – they will assume they're wrong even if they'll assume that the one thing that they don't agree with that they're probably wrong about it because i'm right about everything else and that is how you then can infect um you infect truth and you dilute the truth because the thing is you can tell a half truth or you could end up interjecting um something that's an inaccuracy into it but the thing is because they believe you about everything else and there's a way to validate everything else they're just going to assume that, no, it's not that it's inaccurate. It's that I don't understand or I got it wrong or it's like – or maybe I've been wrong about that that whole time. I don't agree with that one thing, but you know what? He's right about everything else. What if I'm wrong here? And yeah. people who have less self-esteem, people who speak with authority often look for people with less self-esteem to project to because that's how they get their numbers up. And then they can always hold up their opinion as true if enough people support it. Isn't that how cults perpetuate and get started and such? Well, every brand is a cult. <laughs> yeah, I guess yes, that's it true. Is. <laughs> yeah, I guess it's just about how how extremist the the cult. Is. I like to think of yep. this as a small religion. <laughs> <laughs> and it feels like there's like there, we're talking about two lanes of what you're talking about there because there's the there's the min, the knowingly manipulative uh, weaponization of what you're talking about. You, like yes. you said, like you're looking for a certain type of audience and you're looking to change opinion. But then I think it's. The same thing that you're talking about also applies to people that I feel like they're not talking to anybody when they're talking to anybody else. They're more saying those things as loud as they can to convince themselves and re- and remind themselves that what they think and the emotions that they're feeling are right because they're afraid to go three it's levels. It's fear and insecurity. Deeper. Even yeah. half of a level. Because you're, mm-hmm. if you're if you're questioning your own emotions, you're questioning your, your soul. Mm-hmm. You're questioning and, your identity. And your identity, and that's that's scary, and that's a that's a tool that has to be developed, and it's something we don't tend to do or teach. Well, or most help people develop. most people are not by nature self-critical because that's hurtful. They're not self-reflective because that would have to um, then hold them accountable, and it's easier to just fit into the framework you're presented with. And the thing is to challenge the idea that you exist within a flawed framework and to question all of the wise elders and wise masters that have come before you is then to have to, um, one, get past the idea that maybe you're arrogant, but also be confronted by other people with your arrogance to how dare you say that the system is wrong? How dare you say yeah. that all of these things that have come before you are wrong? How dare you diminish what I have done? How dare you? Who the hell are you? Who the fuck are you to do that? Who are the who the fuck are you to tear down what I've built and what I've lived because my identity, my sense of self, every ounce of value I have is tied to the idea that what I did was right. And yeah, so, and, they, and they're banking their lives on that. And also, I think specific. I'm 
have a southern family and the idea yes. of self-introspection is largely considered very not masculine as well so i think a lot of men tend to grow up with and how has that served family. men how has that served men up until <laughs> well now? if we look at the landscape i mean i mean 99 of great. the time we've been right yeah, yeah. don't people miss say, shots well people well in the argument for and we'll we'll divert this in uh, in a minute to the larger context of our social conversation here but in the context of a male-dominated society and a male-dominated world, which I really just feel is leftover scraps from um, the Dark Ages anyway, just through militarization and uh, dominance and Amen, might makes right and all those friend. things. It's just an it's inherited it's an inherited har- hierarchy. It's mm-hmm. inherited hierarchy. It's not a hierarchy that's been dictated by any type of competency. And so there, uh, when you look at well, how's that worked out for men? Well. Again, in the minority, men rule the world, but that's the absolute minority of people. And it's not even that men rule the world, it's people who happen to be wealthy and are also men rule the world. Mm -hmm. And I'm not disconnecting those things. I'll get to that point, because it's like there is a sense of privilege and entitlement there. But where I'm going from is it's it's inherited by nature. The inherit it's a natural consequence of inherited power itself, regardless of who it passes to. Mm -hmm. And Oh, That's right. rigged. And that by the way, that game is rigged. Oh yeah. But I'm where I'm going with that is this. At scale, the way that our idea of masculinity has worked out for men, and this works out even worse for men of color and black men, but uh, the way that masculinity's traditional context has worked out for men has produced the opiate epidemic. It's produced uh, a a world in which men are disproportionately now not pursuing higher education. It's produced men not um, going into, uh, at scale, higher level careers and earning. It's um, mass depression as represented in the opioid epidemic, highest rates of suicides, um, uh, self-abuse, bad marriages, um, you know, fatherless homes at scale, our current framework for masculinity has fucking failed at almost every single conceivable layer. When you measure it at scale, men have disproportionately suffered for a failed framework presented to them, handed down from an era that died a long time and ago. As a and it's time to wake to... up to the goddamn 21st century because mm-hmm. it's a where half the population is men moving through a failed framework that's producing failed results and mass mediocrity and mass misery. It's like, was the framework of our current understanding of masculinity produced at scale? Mediocrity, misery, madness, and murder. See, I'm a marketer. I can package these things. <laughs> that was really the good. I can't wait to see the graphic. <laughs> yeah. Um, so... On a, on a slightly different note, but something that I was thinking about when you brought up that sort of inherited hierarchy that is uh, is passed down and ingrained, and also in doing a little bit of uh, reading yesterday on this the psychoanalysis stuff with the Black Lives Matter yes. um, stuff going on, it, it, the article basically because I was I love that stuff and I I love the brain stuff and I was like, well, what is what would be like a you know, what would Freud basically say about this out of curiosity? What would be his framework? And I found this article from an African-American psychoanalyst who was basically going through the history of the the field and found that rather than finding any kind of framework, it was also itself laced with um, uh, racism, basically, and how it had hindered the movement as a whole. And it was super, super interesting. But in it, she mentioned um, uh, uh, intergenerational trauma. uh, Yes. This sort of idea of of stuff getting inherited and i would really love to uh hear your thoughts on that i'm sure you're you're educated in it but um i'm educated with it but i'm somewhat removed from it as a first generation american because um the the and this is a conversation that happens in terms of intersectionality and so when you want to go into that conversation you have to talk specifically to somebody that's not only african-american but specifically an american descendant of slavery you have to Mm -hmm. talk to them about that because there's a different stigmatized intergenerational trauma it's partly um there is a i believe and it's people think it's psychobabble i believe in somewhat the concept of genetic memory um but I don't exclusively make this about that because I there's, 100% believe there's, in cultural, it, so yeah. there's cultural, there's um, cultural, there's universal cultural truths, and that's also the issue with white privilege. Black trauma or the trauma of uh, American descendants of slaves actually has a complete dovetail to the opposite side of the coin with the concept of white privilege, which you know, 
uh, we can talk about a little bit later, but I want to touch on it in this way because white privilege is not what people in the media on either side would really have you to believe from my perspective. And because when we're talking about inherited hierarchy, we're also talking about inherited um, disadvantages, which also become the storytelling aspects of something. Someone who is groomed for success and told that the world is their oyster and told that people exist to make your life better and people um, exist to help you achieve your full potential is one framework. And there is a group of people who experience that framework. And then you have another group of people that experience the framework of being told that you have to be careful, you have to not take risk, you have to um, be non-threatening, you have to be accommodating, you have to do all these things just to survive. And your priority is to survive, not to thrive, not to grow, mm -hmm. not to conquer, not to contribute, but just to exist with as little suffering as possible. Now, if we took at the first person, the person who's been groomed for success, it's it's not surprising that that person has a they're not necessarily guaranteed to succeed but they have a much easier road to go if that's the cultural story that has been handed down to them and their generation after generation after generation that the world is theirs and Roberto they've the done... person who's um, oh you just have to survive this world that's a completely different set of struggles Roberto mm -hmm. they've done studies where they will give um, in, in uh, psychology departments or whatever, I don't know where it is, but um, where they will have African-American, white, whatever, they'll take it the same test, and then they'll have a different group or, or whatever. I don't remember exactly how it worked, but basically when they asked the African-American students to fill out a survey where they listed what their uh, ethnicity was, Mm. They they did worse than the than when they didn't ask them their ethnicity for the African Americans, whereas the the white or the uh, non black I don't know the the other group yeah was uh, or the, the same. other groups any and, number of other groups right yeah the what I read was basically going like this is they're psycho they're priming uh, they're psychologically priming people before a test yes and it happens with women too if they. Um, with their you know their body images and stuff like that it's, it's used like, in negotiation and it's weaponized in negotiation to get somebody crazy. to ask for less by the way it's Jesus. um it's and it's a sinister practice and it's something there are so many ways that psychology and identity is weaponized and the thing is it's very sinister and it's um something that i've been like in in business coaching i teach and i groom people how to decondition that and um you have to reaffirm a strong individual identity and there's rituals that you have to do mindset rituals because you can you can do your own priming to counter theirs and right in life but you have it, to do that it, do you have it blows my mind that 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 just by filling out that bubble it puts someone in a mindset where they're not going to be as good as they could be normally it's like it's, moving the starting line back it is yes subconsciously it, and i there, yeah, and i think it indicates like what you're talking about with genetic memory or unconscious uh but there's that anxiety, there's there's genetic memory and, and then there's um there's there's um a cognitive dissonance and then there's also a um there's also Intrin the, the intrinsic value tied to identity, and I hope I'm phrasing that correctly. So in psychology, as you already know, and for anybody in the audience who's not familiar, there's a thing called internal and external locus of control. Someone with a high threshold of internal locus of control believes that they are the master of the universe, that they are the author of their own story, and they prioritize. It's not that they don't believe, and this is the thing that why people don't like uh, the concept of meritocracy. There's a separation of that at an individual level versus a systemic level that people don't account for. These are nuanced conversations. And so internal nuance of higher thresholds of internal locus of control does not ignore the fact that external consequences and external reality exist. It deprioritizes it, which is an entirely different thing. Meaning that instead of reacting to you, I'm focused on what I'm capable of or doing and everything like that. Meaning that it's like, oh, I'm not trying to avoid or something that deals with you. I'm just not making you a priority. I know that you exist, but like how you do something will not dictate how I do something. I will do it um, almost as if you don't exist, or at least not in response to you, but with a focus on what is about me. 
Yeah. Um, a primary example of this is, or a good example, and then external, let's explain external locus of control. External locus of control is to give your power to the external circumstances, the conditions that are set before you. So it's the idea that the environment or circumstances or situation is more powerful than my ability to overcome it versus the idea that the circumstances and environment exist, but I'm going to prioritize my means to change or address it rather than it change me. This would be an, ex an example of this would be somebody going into a test and they, if they succeed or fail, they attribute it to their preparation, their uh, talent, and their, um, um, the, their understanding of the subject matter, their affinity for it, and say, you know what, I, I did the work. I did all of these things. I prepped, I studied, I did this, and I succeeded. Now, someone who still succeeds but has an external locus of control would think, wow, you know, I succeeded at this test because my parents were able to afford the tutors that, um, you know, and I, and it's because I listened to those tutors and I had the access to the tutors. I succeeded at this test because I have a wonderful, amazing teacher who explained it so well. Now, if there's a failure, someone with an internal locus of control would say, I didn't study enough. I didn't put in the work. I also don't have a natural affinity for this and I didn't do enough work to overcome those weaknesses. Someone with an external learning system control would say, you know what, the system is rigged, the teacher sucks, um, she should have explained it to me knowing that I learned this way versus someone that way or the fault. system, it's yeah. someone else's fault versus, which is not to take away the fact that maybe there are circumstances that made that harder, but did I do enough to overcome them? Or was there anything that can be done to overcome them? A person with an internal locus of control believes that they can overcome adversity and that they can change an outcome or influence or impact it if they work diligently and hard enough or if they have that ability. Um, somebody with an external locus of control only believes they can succeed if society changes or if the uh, the, the floor is leveled out for them and so on and so forth. There's no way I can do this. It's just too hard and it won't happen unless something else makes it happen for me. The person who wants to, um, who believes that, all right, if I can save up enough money, I can start a business and I can make it work and I know that I have it in me versus someone says, the only way that I can improve my life is if um, the economic systems of our society change to favor people like me. The stars um, align. So the stars have to align. And so that's a completely different mindset. And there is a concept, unfortunately, of conditioning. Conditioning can teach learned helplessness. And it's not that person's fault, by the way, if they are conditioned through abuse. Someone who's in an abusive marriage, they've been stripped of agency and, I, and the ability to have a positive identity to believe that they can overcome. Their belief has been wrong with, for them. Uh, someone who is indoctrinated into ideology, somebody who's radicalized, believes that they don't matter, the cause is all that matters. You see, there's no individual agency, there's no personal power. And that's a tactic that's used to um, leverage people and to exploit them. And the thing is, it exists in systems and structures, racial and otherwise, gender and otherwise, class and otherwise, at multiple levels. And it's been so ingrained into people who believe that they have been, um, they are the chosen ones, that success is theirs, that they do it casually, sometimes not even with malice, but just out of learned behavior of this is how it is done. And this is how it has always been done. Why does it feel like that there's more success attributed to that type of way of thinking with like you see a lot of entrepreneurial, mm -hmm. um, you know, s successful, powerful business people utilizing those tactics? Is there a, is there a connection? Without even those tactics, though, without even those tactics, internal locus of control on every study that they've done in psychology. And I think you guys have probably seen this if you've looked at it. Internal locus of control as a natural, a natural consequence of that psychology produces better results because someone with an internal locus of control naturally takes more risk. Even if they're introverted, they take more risk like me or are more outgoing on average. And the thing is being slightly even above average in that way. And by being above average, it's not the same thing as saying better. And people take me out of context when I say, well, being above average is a choice. I'm talking about de deviating from socially established norms or constructs would make you above average because it would mean that you're not doing the thing that at a median level most people would do. If most people do this and you don't, 
you are an outlier by default. Now, while that doesn't guarantee success, it guarantees abnormal results. It makes you more of an aberration as a result of that action. And the thing is, your results will present as an anomaly because of it, because it's you are a, a deviation. You are a deviation. Yeah, it's Marcus Aurelius. It's like stoicism, basically. It sounds like it can't. Uh, it, some of it. Some people. Is different. Well, or some people neurotic. use that. Well, some uh, yes, yes. Some yeah. people go that route. Some people go that route. You'll see the masculine, successful businessman often does that, but successful women don't necessarily embrace stoicism they just have a, a their own variation of a deviation from the norm the same for successful minorities people of color immigrants they are deviating from norms in whatever social construct they were presented with whereas what most people do as you know is this path of least resistance which is where learned helplessness in psychological studies comes from it is our um, decision our natural inclination to do what presents as easy in fact when you say when people say and they look at success or when they want to demonize it they say well if it was that easy or if it, that was that simple everyone would do it and it's like no they wouldn't because it is a few percentage points different than what is the easiest thing or comparatively easier thing to do because uh, we can all have washboard abs by the way we can all have washboard abs <laughs> yeah, it's just could. a standard deviation from what is easiest to do which is not have washboard abs Right. Not eat good and not That's work pretty out. easy. Um, <laughs> it's simple. It's it sounds not like it's easy. It's simple. It's not that it's easy. It's simple. Where do you think yeah. the where do you think people can find the motivation for um for that type of work ethic? Follow up question to your question, Steve, because mm -hmm. it's and it's a little way back, and I'm hoping it's part of this answer. I want. I was interested in uh, some examples of primers that you brought up. Yes. To to change oh, the, the possible. The yeah. Yes. Uh, to change the inner identity yeah. that, that you're subconsciously dealing with. Mm -hmm. So one of the things I have to do for myself because of black anxiety, which is a cultural, um, you know, like a cultural part of your identity that you can't escape is your blackness. And the same thing you understand, Stephen, that you can't uh, erase your otherness as somebody that's a Mexican. And like my parents couldn't uh, erase their otherness as an immigrant. Mm -hmm. The thing is you have to change the concept of your approach to your otherness to not always be less than in your own mind, even if your experiences, you have to have an internal story that contradicts your experiences sometimes, even if it feels irrational, because you're being presented yeah. with outside, you're being presented with these outside consequences mm -hmm. that are then building a neuro pathway and a memory that says, this is reality and this is your truth. And you need, and it's making you internalize your truth, but it's an external, it's an external stimulant and it's an external that's now being brought in and infecting you internally. And you're internalizing something that you didn't believe before someone else said it. It's like you that programming. It's like being programmed yes. a certain way. Yeah. Well, remember what I said earlier about the YouTube algorithm? Mm -hmm. It's the inputs. If you live within a social construct that makes you feel every day that you are less than and find subtle, casual ways to tell you that you are less than or that you're even different, but not different in a way as to magnify and celebrate that difference, but to suppress it or to highlight it in a way designed to make you insecure about it. Roberto, Whether the, I think, oh, go ahead. No, go ahead. Um, I think it's interesting that with maybe with the exception of chatting about the uh, algorithm, there's like always this sense because it's a we have the podcast and like we want to talk about as much as possible. But what I have found very interesting is it seems like you everything you've talked about is very relevant to the current situation, and it's been very nice to hear. To because you're talking about how your brain processes stuff differently and how you like you know you you operate, but the way you're talking is like. I keep in my mind consciously being like, we haven't talked about everything yet. But as I'm thinking, I'm like, no, you, you are talking about this stuff and you're doing it in a very interesting way. So I appreciate it. Hey, guys, real quick, a word from our sponsor, Bespoke Post. All right. Read, breathe, be natural. Here you go. If your mailbox is anything like mine, 90% of the time it's a fairly depressing place. Political flyers, utility bills, unholy amounts of coupons, which is truth. This part isn't part of the read. This is just me being like, why are they still allowed to do that? What a waste of resources. I don't understand it. 
But once a month, I do have a reason to be stoked, and that's because of my box of awesome from Bespoke Post. Uh, recently, I went back to the website, and they have one that I'm very excited about called Soul, which is some slip-on sandals that look very comfortable that I want. Or there's uh, the Drom Set, or D-R-A-M, Drom, Dram Set, which is all about whiskey. You get uh, mixology glasses, you get a whiskey field guide. It's great. Bespoke Post sends guys only the best stuff every month, and no matter what you're into, Box of Awesome has you covered. From style and grooming goods to barware, cooking tools, and outdoor gear, Box of Awesome has carefully built connections for every part of your life. So to get started, take the quiz at boxofawesome.com. Your answers are going to help them pick the right Box of Awesome for you, and they have everything. (laughs) It's so much stuff. They release new boxes every month across a ton of different categories. It's free to sign up and you can skip a month or cancel any time. Each box costs only 45 bucks, but has over $70 worth of gear inside. And we've gotten a few here at the Valley Folk and true story have yet to be disappointed. So to get 20% off your first monthly box, when you sign up at boxofawesome.com and enter the code valleycast at checkout, that's boxofawesome.com code valleycast for 20% off of your first box. Do it. It's like Christmas every month. And who doesn't like that? Back to us. Yeah. So with me, and this will lead back into what I was just talking about, it doesn't really deviate from it that much, but it's a matter of holistic thinking and the fact that most people, remember why I talked about how most people need simplistic packaging when I talked about YouTube and things? That's true in society too. They need you to be black. They need you to be Mexican. They need you to be white. They need a way to um, classify you for convenience and to not be forced into thoughtfulness because just like exercising for those washboard abs and how difficult that is, having been able to have divergent thought, being able to look at somebody as an abstraction and as an almagam of multiple things and multiple facets and to see them as more than one simple to understand thing and that they are nuanced and that they are contextual would mean that if you can classify them, you can pull these arbitrary things that your social contract set, social construct and social contract says are true without having to do any due diligence and having to ascertain context and truth and nuance for yourself. It's easy, it's lazy dopamine, and it makes your decision-making rubric, it reduces it to chicken, ribs, and fish. And so that is the sinister nature of how lazy we are intellectually as a society, and we don't have the conditioning to make that itself intolerable, and we are able to survive while having that lazy conditioning, whereas if you were not allowed to survive with having lazy thoughts and lazy conditioning, it wouldn't exist, because what do we do? We weed out from our social frameworks and our social contract anything that we as a society create enough consequences for, we don't do. Anything that there are enough consequences for, we eliminate from within ourselves, even to the detriment of individual identity. And the sinister nature of that is that somebody go eliminates their individual cultural identity sometimes for the sake of survival, let alone success. And then it's encouraged in a social contract that says, if you come here, assimilate. If you immigrate, you must also assimilate. If you come here, put our flag first. Change your last name. If you name. come here, change the last name, speak the language. You know, because that's the yeah, that's, simple path for because that's the now easiest, simplest I can path contextualize you as part of the tribe, and I need as many pathways to eliminating your otherness, or I will give you consequences because otherness makes you the enemy. And that is tribalism. And we start trying to get into this framework where people, we have a cultural class now that wants to celebrate tribalism rather than just acknowledge it and also now do better to understand the fact that we've moved beyond the point where we need it, to be frank. It exists in our natural entomology, but it will only exist in our natural entomology for as long as we make it advantageous to do so. We've eliminated everything else that was disadvantageous when we acknowledge that it's disadvantageous, which even goes goes back to the fact that if we can acknowledge that toxic masculinity isn't making masculinity itself toxic, it's acknowledging that we have a social contract that has not been beneficial to men because it leverages their individual identity and holds their masculinity for ransom and says you have to eliminate your personal beliefs and values and expression to be able to be man enough. 
and that's wrong. And I'll give yeah. you an example of it that even somebody that's more libertarian, conservative, I grew up in the South. Like when I explain this to friends of mine, I'm like, okay, you remember our friend who was really straight edge and Christian and his parents barely let him stop being homeschooled and everything like that? Locker room talk goes completely against everything he believes in and everything he's been taught to worship and everything that is with his values. But but what would be held for ransom is if he doesn't participate in it and if he doesn't use the words and if he doesn't call somebody a pussy or if he doesn't do those things, then he's not a man like the rest of y'all and he's other. But his value system, his Christian value system is held for ransom against his masculine identity. And that's what toxic masculinity is, is when you hold anything about an individual for ransom against their identity as a man. And so, and there's many other examples of that sinister nature that we talked about. And this is why I talked about, about some of this psychological priming, do this or you're not a man, do this or you're not professional, do this or you're not ladylike. Wow. Priming. It's good stuff. It's sinister, wow. but it's, well, but again, it's foundational. And until it's not advantageous or until there are not consequences, it persists. And until it's called out, it persists. So, do you think it's right. it's barely being called out, or do you think it's been called out, but it's not being called out in the right way, or what do you think is happening? Well, calling out it doesn't matter if there are no consequences to put us on a corrective path, and if we don't acknowledge that improvement can be made. But why would we acknowledge improvement can be made, and why would people who it's benefited acknowledge that improvement can be made? And if it's benefited people, and they are loud enough and successful enough, even people who it hasn't benefited will believe in it because. If they haven't produced those results, well, who are they to contradict? The who, Remember what I said earlier? Well, who are you, you arrogant son of a gun? Who are you to demonize what has been built and what has been established and what has gone for hundreds and thousands of years? Who the fuck are you to say that the world is wrong? It's like when Karl Marx is like, hey, there might be some problems with capitalism. And now everybody's like, Marx just invented communism. And instead he was just like, no, you need to acknowledge that there's problems with this system and it's going to have a negative effect ultimately on everybody but because we don't want to look at the problems we just go no we're fine everything's that's fine. what i It'll love about itself. that's what i love about andrew yang is that he doesn't necessarily demonize capitalism he says that it's at scale and ray dalio who is a billionaire mm -hmm. says that he doesn't believe that the uh 18th and 19th century version of capitalism that we've clinged to it, that it probably shouldn't have survived the 20th century and it damn sure shouldn't survive the 20th century we're gonna follow it off a cliff and the, the person who invented GDP says that we should never use this as um, a model for progress or to see how well we're doing. And it's like, it's not practical. And I, I didn't know that. His stuff on the, the GDP was super, super interesting. But I've always thought same about the, the unemployment. The well, unemployment here's the thing. Rate. I believe we have the same problem with education. And this loops back and this will lose back into what we were talking about, because uh, I especially want to go back to part of our conversation and like my uh, four big things that we wanted to talk about in the podcast. If you guys got time, please. Um, the so one of the problems with education that I see that exists mostly in Western education is that it is evaluative versus diagnostic. And it is to put people into a framework versus allowing them to develop their own. And it doesn't, um, it doesn't evaluate, here is what you are good at. Let's evaluate what you are good at and also where your motivations lie. And let's now help you to align that to servicing the needs of the world and in such a way that you will be able to sustain your life. And that is a framework that is a part of Eastern philosophy called Ikigai, wherein you look at what is it that you are passionate about? What is it that you actually have skills or ability or natural aptitudes for? What are the needs of the world and how you serve others? And what uh, will people pay for? And we need to align those things and also figure out what makes that, those things right size in your life. But Roberto, and, what if my circles are like, I'm like this good at this thing, and like I'm a little okay at this. I think my circles are smaller is what I'm saying. But the thing is, <laughs> even if they are, the thing is we then have to start to help you to diagnose your potential and oh. say, you might have this much skill at this now, but what is your aptitude and capacity for growth? You might be naturally talented That's at lovely. something, but you might be very close to the current level of talent you have at something might be very close to what your maximum capacity is, which means that Maybe you don't go all in on that because you naturally, if you're naturally a B plus at something, then yeah, you, move on. 
you can the thing is you can acknowledge that thing and for a time maybe you can profit from that thing and do that thing if you like it if you like it but here's the thing if you have all this untapped latent potential that might make you happier and might be more scalable then we should develop and cultivate that in you and not ignore it and the thing is even if what is in you doesn't have an obvious market play we should help you figure out what the market play is for it if it's the thing that you that brings you the most happiness if you love it the most like if that. you're if you're good enough at it because the reality is in the market you only have to be better than the person paying for it <laughs> like mm -hmm. yep. you only have to be yep. incrementally and sometimes you don't have to be better than them their might their thing might be i just don't have the time and so i don't need the best quality i need it now like and that might be a hole that you can fulfill well the, uh, let's, uh Oh. oh, sorry. Yeah, I was just going to say with the, the evaluative uh, nature of the education is incredibly true because, you know, my, my daughter is in going into eighth grade now. Yeah. And one of the most interesting out of the box ideas that she's experienced and, and also with because I didn't experience this in my education um, was in fifth grade when they were like the semester project is they get to pick a subject and go all in on it, whatever they want. They get to become the teachers. They get to, they get to find out what their interests are, and that's what they will be graded that's on. That's cool. And that was the most out of the box, creative, educational thing that I've heard in a long time. And it's sad, like you were saying, because everything else is evaluative, evaluative, or now part of like a, a standardized test or something. And the like thing that. is, it doesn't serve the individual potential. And the thing is, a lot yep. of the problems in our society could be addressed by acknowledging people's individual potential, helping them scale and adapt it to be valuable in the market and viable in the market instead of saying, there's no market for that. Like, first of all, yes, there is. And then here is what that market is. And then the thing is, are you okay with that? Ask the question. The thing is, our education model presumes too much. It offers and dictates answers that it has no right to instead of asking the fundamental question of who you are and helping you to address what that means and maximize who you are to your best benefit and to the best benefit of society and make sure that those things are in alignment and not at your expense. Because currently, people are made to serve society in some capacity, usually to their own detriment. Now, I won't go so far as to say that that's always exploitive, but they are put in positions where it can be. And it's because if you actually understood your market value and you actually had your skills properly adapted and monetized, you have leverage. If that's not true, you don't. Wow. That's excellent. Um, it's, I've learned recently that this all the standardized tests also came out of the World War II as a way of um, finding out who was too smart to go to war. Basically, the standardized tests were like, if you score high on this, you don't have to go die for the country. I think they said the and same thing about kept... police officers, right? Like, if you have too high of an IQ, they'll refuse your... Oh, I don't know if you if you score it's too high in critical thinking, if you score too high in critical thinking, if you're too much of a and it's funny, a lot of people who um you know psychologically um they like a lot of people who publicly claim to say that they're critical thinkers and that they're independent thinkers and they call people sheep. You'll if you actually put them through um, any type of testing rubric to actually see where they lie and identify, you'll find that they actually don't have high level critical thinking skills and they actually don't challenge authority. People have mistaken being contrarian or being aggressive for being an independent thinker and they're not the same thing. And they don't understand what an actual um, true capacity for critical thinking would look like because the thing is it presents and manifests in pretty easy to determine in obvious ways. Wow. Uh, wonderful. Well, Roberto, I want to hear your four points. Please. Sir. Yes. Um, so I actually have them here um, so that uh, we can talk about them. I think it's super important right now with what's going on to talk about um, just exploring thoughts on criminal justice. And I just kind of like, you know, um, for me, I think it's obvious that criminal justice reform has to be one of the biggest conversations in our society right now at multiple levels. Uh, we talked about, we were just talking about the police and we were just talking about the standards have to be raised. Van Jones brought this up. The standards have to be raised for who is allowed to be a, a police officer, but we also need to have a lot better accountability within law enforcement. And there's actionable steps that we can take uh, for that. And the reality is that it should not take this. And the thing is we need to remove some of these 
um, what do they call it, one of the uh, professional courtesies that have been afforded within that profession because it's not a profession where, oh, I'm giving you a professional courtesy before we um, – you know, move to a cease and desist letter or something like that within a business negotiation, within a handshake. Like, like, no, 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 no. This is life and death quite literally. And so the professional courtesy extended to the three officers that were complicit in the murder of George Floyd, the professional courtesy of allowing them time to turn themselves in, the average citizen is not going to be allowed that same courtesy. Mm -mm. We're all under the rule of law and it should be applied evenly. And law enforcement has created a culture and a system where they get to play by their own rules and where they're allowed courtesies that the average citizen isn't and the thing is they should be they should have more accountability with great power must come great responsibility and with great responsibility what that looks like is more accountability more scrutiny and more consequences not less right and they have less and that's the abuse of power and that's the systemic injustice that happens to people and disproportionately people of color it's It's also borderline a recruiting point right it's it is yeah, you come and hang out. And you right. get to be a special. Here's what you get, get and here's how you're treated. And if you want, you could murder yep. someone, and we'll look at all the minute details of how it happened. You'll be afforded your absolute benefit of the doubt in a way that no other person will be. That is the truly insidious nature of privilege. And do you privilege think that is not oh. necessarily just power? It is the concept of you are afforded graces and thoughtfulness and courtesies that were not merited or not earned and are deprived to other people because I'm not someone who believes that everything absolutely under the sun should be egalitarian. But the thing is, there is not a natural reason to um, a lot or to protect these people from consequences. So there's not. Yeah. Do you think that there's you know, that th- there's a lot of different ways to attack this and to, to remedy this. But do you think that I prefer the word remedy in this case to attack? <laughs> sure, sure, yes, remedy. My bad. There are ways. To, there are ways to remedy this, and um, you know, what are those ways? I mean, because you could say like, let's fire everyone who's a police officer, or let's fix this curriculum. Let's fix the way that we train. Well, these- here's how. Uh, I don't have all the answers, but here's how we do it in business. In a business, there's a lot of things you do. And the thing is, one, if you want the best business in the world, you have the highest standards in the world for who you recruit. That's why talent managers and talent recruiters, and you guys even know this as content creators in entertainment, that it's like the uh, if you want the best group, the best agency, the best whatever, you get the best talent. You don't get, you don't scrape the bottom of the bar- barrel. If you wanted people who have absolutely great judgment and great discernment, then you don't filter people out that. Um, have high levels of independence and critical thinking because they're more likely to follow orders. And the thing is, if you have a system that is all about following orders versus the ability to say, we need people who in the moment are capable of judgment, then you have to change the standards and you have to test accordingly for that. Adding scrutiny to people's background checks, they there there were there are, there are representatives in our lawmaking body who struck down bipartisan measures to make specific criteria um, part of people's screening and backgrounds for things like white supremacy and other things. Ugh. And the thing is, hate to break it to you, yeah, you need to get people who are going to be law enforcement. They need to give you access to all their social media profiles. Sorry, that's the 100%. truth. You need that because you need to know who you're dealing with and they need to not be able to hide that. And yes, I know that we have privacy as citizens and we should have it. When you ask for power, you should give up some of that. Great power, great responsibility. When you ask for the power over other people and other citizens and for powers that are not allotted to the rest of us, you should have to give something up in exchange for that. In the same way, we lose some privacy by giving in exchange for the power of being public figures and having a platform. There's a lot of scrutiny that is added to us in exchange for that. I mean, I, I feel like in my mind, a police officer is like, and this is to your point, but in a slightly different way, I think like they are also wanting to be public servants and serve and protect and you know that's sort of the idealistic lofty goal and as such i think on one hand yeah you get power so you can see it as an exchange but i also think that if you are if you are dedicating your life to serving the public and keeping people safe then you should own that and it should be part of that sort of sacrifice that you're making because otherwise like you should do it out of wanting to show that you are protecting people you're putting your body uh, on the line world if you're putting your body on the line, what's the problem with um, with putting your uh, your Twitter 
like, like giving me your Twitter to see if we're we're kosher here, like to see yeah. if we're okay, to like, see if like we're good here. Like it's not my body, it's my inner thoughts, my my really uh, cool inner, my very important racist <laughs> thoughts that I'm putting on Facebook. <laughs> well, the thing is, we see this with uh, the Facebook groups with um, the people that were in um, the Border Patrol. We see it with um, Facebook groups that are being leaked of law enforcement. And again, yes, it's not everybody, but the thing is, even if it's not everybody, it's a culture of people that are obligated and obliged to protect their comrades. And so the thing is. You have to, in my opinion, you have to address it instead of making the presumption that it's not everybody. Let's audit and see who it is. Let's audit and see who it is. Because in a business, in a business, if a department is failing, you might audit not only that entire department and evaluate and see, like, where, where's the problem lie and who's contributing to the problem, who's mitigating the problem. Let's go ahead and reprimand people who are contri- uh, that are causing the problem and people who are countering the problem. Let's elevate them and let's incentivize them. And so let's do that. And we do that through consequences. We do that through consequences. People who clearly are doing the right things, we incentivize them to continue to do those things and for more people to do likewise. And people doing the wrong things have to have absolute consequences and they have to be a deterrent. We, like The president loves creating consequences and deterrents for people who disagree with him. But um, do our systems and do our leaders create consequences for people who ultimately are contributing to the destruction of our society and to an uh, unjust uh, culture and framework within our law enforcement body and everything like that. So just like I said about the education system, that instead of being evaluative, we need to be diagnostic. To get to these problems, we have to be diagnostic in this. You have to say, we're going to do an audit of every police department and all of our internal systems. And the thing is, we're going to have a standard. And that standard, no, you can't give it to the individual departments to decide that standard. You can't give it to the individual state. States. You can't give it to at the local level. You can't because it's a systemic injustice and we need continuity and we need accountability and we need standards. No one gets to make their own fiefdoms anymore. No one gets to make their own rules anymore. And I'm sorry that that feels like people like an infringement of things. But the thing is, the stakes are too high to let everybody be cowboys. And you have to have uniformity. Right. And it's that simple idea of like, you know, it, it, this is why we can't have nice things, you know, because, yeah. <laughs> you know, simply it's because too many people ruined these concepts of leeway or or something like that in these industries where permissibleness right exactly exactly you 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 want to like you want to have a certain talking point you want to say oh we have a permissive society it's like yeah and the thing is that permissiveness starts with people who have power not people who don't right Mm -hmm. powerful stuff yeah yeah the key word that i keep hearing and and you know all cards on the table i've i've chosen in the last couple weeks to just try to do a lot of listening and a lot of learning and there's i'm i'm ignorant to a lot of this stuff and i've never really sure. thought about the criminal justice system the more than i have thought about it lately and it does seem like a starting point a very important word is accountability and that's a scary word for people on the other side because it like is. you said it revokes a free pass and it changes it changes uh you know the, the it changes consequences the, it means the stakes the are system. higher yeah yeah it changes and the they system they don't want to but the thing is, exactly, why would they want to? Why would they want to? Yeah. And again, if you don't experience, and here's, what, remember why I said earlier about there's a psychological profile of, well, if I haven't experienced that, then it's not real. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Or think about this. Think about the type of person that we talked about that psychologically is profiled and is, like, and is deemed to be a good law enforcement officer versus not. Do you really, and this is not a judgment or a blanket statement, but do you think that is possible that somebody who uh, goes into and is recruited and is doing well through that, is that person more likely to be a literalist and to be um, a little bit more rigid and uh, more in line with black and white thinking or somebody who is more likely to be creative and abstract? Right, I would say the former, but I would also argue that an ability to be rigid, see in black and white and binary thinking basically Yes. If you are going to have a job where that came in handy, it is important for police officers to be able to flip a switch at times and to be able to make quick decisions. I think, unfortunately, yes. though, because they're so in that mind frame, yeah, what you're talking it's about It's too is, much of the spectrum, and the much, thing is, yeah. it's too much in the spectrum, and they're not conditioned in a way and not trained to, um, to go a different way. And the thing yeah. is, it's yeah. too much... It's too much the idea, not every situation is life and death, and to be able to evaluate that properly, to diagnose that properly, to be able to diagnose properly when things need to escalate versus not, clearly has not been done well, clearly. I don't mm-hmm. think anybody argues with that, that like 
okay, they escalate too quickly. And again, regardless of what where you are in the political spectrum, no one, regardless of where they are in the political spectrum, should be in favor of the militarization of police. They should not be in favor of that, and they should not be in favor of the escalation of violence um, against citizens, let alone violence against unarmed citizens, by the state. By the state. I hear from a lot of my friends growing up here in the South and in the South how much they talk about the state, how much they talk about the state. And they're very quiet right now. They're very quiet right now. And I'm, I'm struggling to understand and ascertain why. And the only thing I can come up with is they need to rationalize that it was justified because, again, if it exists outside of their framework of experience, it's an injustice when I experience it. It's a problem when I experience it. I, For example, a lot of my friends, um, they had experiences where, oh, this isn't real, and then it happens to them. COVID-19. COVID-19. I've known people that have said, I was a COVID-19 de um, denier until it happened to a family member of mine, and now I, I'm on the other side of it. I'm real. Um, it's real. Oh, like, I was an anti-vaxxer until my kid got sick. Oh, I hated Obamacare and said I'd never do it until I got cancer. Ooh, Roberto, like, don't you bring up that flat earth. If you bring up that flat earth, it's a flat <laughs> earth, Roberto. Like, but, there's, I'm, but I'm telling you, I literally have met people that their psychological framework is until I experience it myself, it doesn't exist. I feel like most yeah, people I see... So you've been I to Florida. See, All right. <laughs> I feel like most people I see out in the streets not wearing the masks and not caring and gathering at the beach and all that during the pandemic it feels to me like that's who those people are they're people that have chosen to either not believe that it even exists or not believe that they can get it or something you know well it's that's simpler a, to believe that it doesn't right for some people and it's and see, safer uh, right this abil inability to um because again these people are capable of compassion but they have very limited capacity for true empathy because true empathy only exists for someone who's capable of putting themselves in another person's shoes and the ability to do that requires imagination and abstraction the Dude, ability to these are the, the same people who love who freak out over uh dogs they love dogs they love animals and not the i'm not talking like the vegan stuff and all yeah. that but people who on who have that binary thinking as a whole tend to uh, put all of their empathy into their dogs and into basically non-humans because they don't have the ability as human beings to connect with another human being. So because animals don't perfect. require any nuance. Animals don't require nuance. Animals exactly, don't yeah. require contextualization. Dogs are dogs. Cats are cats. You see what I'm saying? Remember the <laughs> right. categorization? Remember the categorization? Yeah. Ah, the, and remember what happened when we opened up the YouTube algorithm to normies at scale? It started to reflect the world we live in instead of the world we wanted to build. Normies See? at Scale was our first company name before we decided on Valley <laughs> yeah. But yeah, but again, when w because see, the normalization of the actual ecosystem of the world bleeding into what was a very insular ecosystem. Another example, you, like I know and believe all of you to be good, well-meaning, empathetic people who um, are not in any way bigoted. But there's a comfort level in not extending and stretching beyond your own friend group that then gives you blind spots to, that lead to um, a neglect of and a blind spot to a wider issue to where you would be open to new experiences if you had them, but you're not having them. And there I was a choice. Roberto, Roberto, I could do you one better. I don't even like experiencing things with my friends. <laughs> So. That's true. That is, he's not lying. This yeah. is not that, for a clip. Well, that, well now this we're going just... into introversion, which is another. <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> but, but you see what I'm saying is that the ability to solve problems and diagnose problems has many issues with it in itself because the thing is there are people who can't acknowledge problems because they have a psychology wherein until they experience the problem, it doesn't exist. And then there are the type of people who would be open to um, new experiences but aren't having them through other choices that they made because it's less comfortable. And remember what I said about the easy dopamine and the path of least resistance. So the thing is, this is the problem with our um, social framework at scale. And it goes into, and the thing is, our social framework at scale produces individuals that then build the systems we all live with and there's consequences for that. So the more insular people, the more people 
um, also cannot deal in nuance and abstractions and context and are more rigid and have binary black and white thinking. If these are the people that exist within our power structures, that's those, these are the people who are not wanting change. They are wanting to preserve what they understand even when it doesn't benefit them and they also sometimes lack the ability to feel that, to understand what does benefit them in the long term versus what is just comfortable and what they are accustomed to. I love that's that. That's the insidious I mean, you're just talking about like the macrocosm that is Trump's inability to even lie to himself for two seconds to say one sentence that would bring everybody together and and solve the situation just a little just a bit of empathy that would that, w- <laughs> that would go miles right. for his likability and the his power of, but he yeah. can't do it he can't because help he himself. is the most binary he, he cannot help himself yep uh, the person yep. we're talking about cannot help himself you guys are just liberals projecting on him. so uh <laughs> i say that i say that uh, as someone who considers themselves uh, anyway so no. uh, i consider myself moderate and like closet libertarian maybe like i lean more left on social issues and like more moderate but fiscally conservative like but not in an extreme way because again i support ubi for mostly the psychological reasons that ubi is practical but also the fiscal reasons and what sold me on it was the funding mechanism the funding mechanism makes sense to me because in the 21st century economy which ties back to something else i was saying about like the concept of internal locus of control, exploitation, and needing to see systemic change to believe that things can even happen for you, um, needing the environment or landscape to change in some way. If people's basic needs from Maslow's hierarchy at the bottom level, if the floor of Maslow's hierarchy is met, then the stress that actually eats holes in people's brain goes away and we now have a pathway to monetizing an individual's full potential and seeing what their contribution is or can be. Let's actually do it. Let's audit whether people are naturally lazy and to what extent. Because the thing is, I almost guarantee you, psychologically, people will try indolence and idleness and then they'll get depressed because they have no challenge and you are built at a DNA level to need to solve problems and you're not going out and hunting for food anymore you're not going to the wilderness and now if you don't have to do a shit shift job to get by anymore there's some part of you that's gonna be like well what can i do what is the maximum potential of what i can do but then there's also that insecurity too of like you know what yeah i'm not starving to death i'm surviving and i'm at home and i'm chilling and playing video games and smoking weed but you know what that doesn't seem as nice to me as having a tesla because I uh, that dude have that has that Tesla well, that sounds better. Oh, maybe. I'm not. Or but oh, I, I can't get a... laid anymore. Oh wait, I can't get laid anymore because I'm now not competitive in that. Well, way? in my universal basic income plan, I also am including a uh, uh, a certain amount of getting laid per month that is offered by. <laughs> okay, the so you well. want um, so you want a conjugal stipend. You want a conjugal <laughs> stipend added to the. So on top of the UBI, you want a conjugal stipend. Yes, yes, sir. Okay. Which brings me uh, to so my, which brings me. me to my sex robot idea. Are you guys willing to hear this? <laughs> hey, so everything's losing to automation. Robot. Hey, as long so as the, everything's losing to automation. What you bring up? I know. What you bring up there? Oh, sorry. Are you moving on from UBI? Because I have one more point. Well, yeah, about. we're at an hour and a half. We do need oh, to sorry. start wrapping this up because it's sure. just getting into territory that's like real, real long. But I would also love to have Roberto back. But I also want to make sure we hit all of Roberto's points. So yes, let's please do that. So where do we want to go next? Um, or oh, actually, I can go. All right, so I can tie some of this together. Let's start to tie some of this up, and then um, we'll start to wrap up here. But the insidious nature of um, the social dynamics and power structure presents in ways that are massively disadvantaged to people of color, but especially the black community. And that presents at least uh, something that I've been explaining and exploring is <clears throat> the concept of black anxiety. And it dovetails into how we start to define the concept of privilege, because privilege isn't just uh, an abuse of power, but it's a neglect and a negligence of care too. And so it's part of understanding that when I wake up in the morning, When I decide that I'm going to leave my house, the worst thing that I can imagine happened to me is being killed by the police or by vigilantes for mistaken identity or being in the wrong place at the wrong time. When I get pulled over, I have to consider not that, oh, this is an inconvenience and I'm going to get a ticket. I have to consider that this might be the last moments of my life. When I go somewhere, I have to make sure that I'm wearing my Apple Watch and maybe that I have my AirPods in because 
I need to be respected and to have people understand that when I'm walking around the store, I make enough money to not have to steal. Wow, and, that's crazy. That's insane. And and so um, black anxiety is knowing that no matter how a comp – oh, the fact that I have to also know that in any situation, I have to be non-threatening, especially with police. Even if I'm in the right, I have to pretend that I'm in the wrong and I have to be accommodating and I have to be non-threatening. You have to disprove a negative the moment you the walk The presumption out of, of innocence, it's waking up every day knowing the presumption of innocence doesn't apply to me. It's living in an open carry state and feeling that as a black man, my Second Amendment right would be a death sentence for me because of that presumption of innocence, the presumption that my use of a gun is for self-defense and not for criminal activity mm. is not mm. granted in the way that it would if I were a white man. And so, your bottom, in, your bottom huh? floor is eggshells, is what you're um, saying. Like, I'm in Georgia, yeah. and before that yeah. was North Carolina, both of which are open carry states where the Second Amendment is heavily encouraged and advocated for, but it doesn't apply to us unilaterally and equally in a society where you literally have video footage of a 12-year-old, 14-year-old boy, I believe it was Tamar Rice, who was gunned down playing in a park with a toy gun, something that no white parent would ever have a, a, a doubt or a thought about their child doing playing cowboys and indians is what it was when i grew up and so that is a death sentence playing outside with a toy gun is a death sentence for a black child it is letting your child play outside for a black parent is wondering if they're going to leave the house a human being and fail to come back and become a hashtag that's black anxiety black anxiety is knowing that when you walk outside, that life is very different for you through no fault of your own, and that there's nothing you can do about it, and no matter how much money you make, no matter how privileged you become, no matter how much you fuel the engine of meritocracy, no matter what your contributions, you will always be treated as a second-class citizen if you're lucky, and at worst, a threat, and your life is inconvenient to somebody else's uh, authority or comfort. Yeah. Your very existence is an inconvenience at best and a threat at worst. Wow. That is black anxiety. That is the black experience. That is something that if you, I, I have to ask you, do you wake up every morning thinking that? Nope. No? No, absolutely not. Do nope. you do you feel at times like this, Roberto, that that is becoming amplified, or do you feel a sense of community? Like, is it is the anxiety heightened because it's reopening old wounds? Yeah, both? It's it's both because it is reopening old, old wounds. Me, I actually personally was the victim years ago of vigilante justice and um, racial profiling and mistaken identity. Uh uh, 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 a nondescript black guy who, as it turns out, was literally six inches taller than me and like two or three shades lighter than me with a completely different haircut, shoots up um, the bar that I'm at. I run out um, the back of the bar where a lot of people get separated from them, end up in an alley trying to call the cops, and then five dudes say, hey, that guy's the shooter. It was a black guy. And I do everything to try to defuse the situation and to... Um, de-escalate everything and i am literally i'm like look i'm literally calling the cops and they're like nah you're calling your ride and it's Ugh. like and they the, all the accusations where's the gun like trying to hold me down and like pat me down and like where'd you ditch it where like like this whole no thing and they're amped up and this is a military town all these dudes are like jacked and it's like and so um i literally managed to hold my own i couldn't fight back the thing is you're trying to stay alive in that situation I'm a little guy. I'm 5'7". It's only because of some of my own training and some of my um, my own uh, martial arts background and because I actually lived next door to a law enforcement officer who actually gave me some additional training um, that I was able to physically survive that encounter with no life-threatening and no life-scarring debilitating injuries or anything, but it was a really damn near thing, and it's just a matter of the fact that I stopped the, the blows that would do it. And eventually, my one of my friends, who was a white bouncer for the bar, came upon us and ran them off. And when he was running them off, I was alone, and I stumble out the alley, and what happens? Um, I try to flag down this lovely white couple for help and the dude 
um, is yelling at me, the girl is screaming, and they push me away. Instead of seeing me as somebody that needs help and a victim, I'm a threat. And I'm begging for help, and they push me away, and they go on about their thing. I flag down the police officer in his, his car. Oh, thank God. And no, no, oh, thank God. The cop is sitting there not treating me in any humane way, doesn't come in out of his car and doesn't check, refuses to come out of his car and check on me or to hear me or anything like that, makes me walk alongside his car back to the bar uh, downtown where my white friends vouch for me. And then, and only then does he change his tune and stop treating me like a suspect or a perp and barely tries to treat me like a victim and get my statement. And when I get to the hospital, it is the same damn thing because when they jacked me up they also took my keys my wallet everything and stuff like that and uh so i don't have my social security uh card and my um and i don't have my um health insurance card and so they treat me practically like a homeless person they do almost nothing for me they do give me my ct scan and they do that but in terms of cleaning me up and giving me anything like the, no care and no compassion I mean, you just even with my alone. friend who works at the hospital oh. vouching for me this is literally this is my experience and every time i scroll in twitter or instagram i'm resubjecting myself to the actual lived experience of this every minute which is why i've had to somewhat stop that and beg people to put positive things out that I can scroll through, that I can bookmark. And so, yes, it's relived trauma, but this is also the actual reality of um, what people go through when this happens and why we have to say things like Black Lives Matter and we have to say things like justice for George Floyd and all these things, be and enough is enough. We have to say these things because this I don't think you can imagine an experience or any interaction you've had with law enforcement playing out this way. And the thing is, that's why we can't trust them sometimes to know that we get a good cop, did we get a bad cop, did we get someone who is actively racist and bigoted, or just somebody who's going to neglect us. Um, speaking of uh, binary thinking, I mean, good cop, bad cop, it's like the the few few bad apples uh, line that everybody likes to use. It's like, well, yeah, there's some really, really bad apples there's a whole lot more apples that maybe aren't totally rotten to the core, but they still got some holes in them, and they're still not something you'd want to, like, you know, bite into for a delicious snack. So I feel yep. like it's, like, the problem is so complex and so widespread that, yeah, every it's touched uh, an entire community of people and then left other people to just be completely oblivious to it. Yeah. Which leads back to what you're talking about with that cognitive dissonance being able we to like, can't, well, doesn't, I don't understand it. I mean, we have no presumption. We, we have to live with the anxiety of like, unless we end up being a hashtag, we're not going to get justice. I didn't get justice. It was a small military town. We found one of the guys and it was, um, it was four white guys and one Hispanic guy. And guess who ends up be, ends up being the fall guy, the Hispanic guy. And he's the only one who came forward and turned himself in, and he refused to turn in his four buddies. And their excuses, they were drunk, they thought they had the right guy. The, having the right guy doesn't give you the right to take matters into your own hands. You are not above the law, and you are not the law. And they thought they were doing their due diligence and their duty and everything, excuse after excuse. But the thing is, I couldn't trust even going after and pursuing things because like, they were like, well, you can press charges against him. But the thing is, somebody in his crew, because they never returned my thing, someone in his crew has... My phone had my phone, my contact list, my ID, and knows where I live. And it's a small town and a small community. And nobody and gives it's a, a military shit. town. And you, you know, like, hmm, can I trust that there's no retribution? Can I trust that, like, if you don't get all of them? And then the thing is, even if you get all of them, well, how are their buddies gonna react and everything like that? So you can't. In a lot of times. You know that there's no justice for you because you know you're not in a framework, you're not in an environment that is about justice for all and is not about uh, everybody having an equal experience or an equal opportunity. You and you know, and the thing is, if you're black or if you're Latino, you know that. If you're a woman, like, look, I'm a dude. I don't sit there and I don't think every time I walked out my door, the worst what that on the list of the worst things that can happen to me, it doesn't really cross my mind that I'm going to be raped in a bathroom somewhere. But if I, but the thing is, it is the thing that I fear every time my sisters walk out the door. So when you consider that, like that's the difference of, okay, the privilege exists in knowing that that's not your truth and that's not your reality and that it wouldn't cross your mind that that's what would happen to you. Thank you for yeah, sharing I that, do. Roberto, because that sounds like literally a nightmare. 
and I can't even I can't even begin to understand that. But I but thank you for sharing that with us. That's a very that's a very um, powerful fucking thing. Yeah, that's, I mean I don't. Yeah, yeah. I don't like. Not, not to speak for you, but when you talk about the privilege of the the situation, like yeah. it wasn't just, it wasn't just the cops in that in yeah. that scenario. It was your fellow man, and then it was uh, a nice couple walking down the street, which is the rest of society, and then the hospital, like all of it, all together. And you're right, I don't like in every single one of those steps. I I mean, I would assume. And, and that I would get the better version of that. I was friends the, with the, the care, owner. All of it. I was friends with the owner of that bar. I was friends with the management of that bar. Later to find out, I mean, they, they did try to um, like help out in some ways, but they also wanted most of this to go away because he personally had some unrelated shady stuff where he just didn't want cops around. Um, and we all found that out like years later when he like you know left town and stuff like that. So it was this like it's this thing where at every single level, yeah, it's this thing where at every single level, every single level where a human being could have done the right thing or had empathy or had compassion or looked at the situation and saw their fellow man in need, failed me, and it fails people like me every single day at a systemic level at every aspect of our society, and in some cases it's abuse. And in other cases, it's neglect. And all of it is rooted in a lack of empathy and a lack of understanding and a lack of benefit of the doubt. And the thing is, you can change as many laws as you want, and that will help. And you can hold people accountable, and that will help. But until people are willing to change how we operate and think as a culture, as a society in this country and at scale in the world and we all move the needle on humanity our inner humanity and until frankly we have a more educated class of people as a baseline for society there will be more victims like George Floyd there will be more victims like um, you know Eric uh, Garter there will be like Eric Greed there will be like there will be more names there will be more hashtags there will be more people and there will be and when it's not murder when it's not abuse of civil liberties it will be casual racism it will be neglect it will be redlining taking some other form it will be something else I think too like a a side of this whole situation is the opportunity to like everyone could probably use a little bit more empathy in their lives and situations like this for the majority of people it's you know we're glued to our phones and we're watching it on tv and we're it, we're still in sort of the comfort of our quarantine lives it's a wonderful opportunity to start trying to flex the empathy muscle a little bit and be like all right let me let me explore this emotionally and and intellectually and get somewhere new because that way hopefully maybe when you know we are moving into the future when different things happen when those like lower forms of uh discrimination happen maybe people will be a little bit better prepared to handle them with with the work that they could choose to put in uh now well, you remember how I talked about with the YouTube algorithm that it's all reactionary and it's all inputs because it's a responsive system? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But that, that's designed because human beings themselves are that too, is that when, you, it, when you're the five people you hang out with the most, you're the people in your friend group unless you expand beyond that, so on and so forth, given the choice and given the option and given unlimited choices and unlimited options, people have gravitated toward comfort. People have built their own operating system, their own algorithm wherein they only have a limited range of experiences despite the fact that they have more access to more cultures, more experiences at a push of a click, at a push of a button than ever before, which means at a fundamental level, going back to education, you have to change how people are educated because the thing is, the experiences that I talked about and everything like that, you know, you barely get I, throughout your whole lives. You tell me, was it barely touched on and was it communicating graphic detail in any meaningful way? The once out of the year for 30, sorry, 28 days, the shortest month of the year that you guys got in school in Black History Month. Oh, not at all. The, the, the history that I got growing up in Montana was, you know, you know, I heard words and sentences like Jim Crow and. Uh, it was uh, it was a paragraph in a history book. You know, there was no emotion connected to the lesson. And so the lesson wasn't uh, one that was ubiquitous on an emotional level or a humanity level. No one can watch. 
Nobody with any shred of humanity can watch what happened to George Floyd and not be touched by it, which is why this moment is so different than reading about it in a textbook. Mm -hmm. I feel like with textbooks and stuff, like the uh, learning history, it's kind of like how when you're a kid and you eat a McDonald's hamburger and then later you find out that the hamburger is a cow, but you don't understand that, so you never really internalize the fact that meat is like you know an animal because your brain goes okay it's just a burger i'm a kid i don't know but when you watch what happens at slaughterhouse right then all you can't sudden, unsee it, can, it yeah it can kind of wake you up and i feel like for for history i didn't know growing up that history could be viewed in any sort of empathetic or any sort of emotional context it was sort of like any other subject you study it you memorize the facts and you move on and so there was because you're getting necessary. your grade because it's evaluative and not diagnostic it's and it's also yeah, it, not and it's checking a box and it's and not, it's not meant to have an impact on you it's meant to prove that you're capable of memorizing facts because that is what was deemed useful in the framework that they're going to throw you into by default yeah and that yeah. i think is to the point of what the the word systemic means where it's like there's no it's in my experience there was no conscious concerted effort to suppress empathy producing stories from people so much as there was a system in place that was such that yeah it wasn't even an option it, w- it didn't serve the purpose of the of the schooling system for me to learn to be empathetic remember what i said about abuse versus neglect yeah and if we're, like, yeah. in our upbringing and i think the time as well it wasn't just an educational um missing out on it was also uh, like uh, uh, a cultural one because i I'm trying to have conversations with my daughter now about what's going on and trying to educate myself and, and, and pass on to her as much knowledge as I possibly can. And what I am realizing across the board is that not once was this type of conversation ever had with me. So I'm struggling to find the words at times while I'm educating myself through this moment trying what, to make sure she's not missing out on the lessons what, as well what what i would do is i would reach out to um you know um friends from different backgrounds in this particular case for these circumstances and everything like that reach out to friends who are black or african-american and have the, have them have be able to help you in educating her and then maybe even have them help educate your children directly I've heard uh, that because then it's other people kind of who've just been posting like stop asking me for recommendations here's what i think <laughs> please please my dms are getting filled you i know you mean yeah. well but it's too much yeah no it's a it's one of those things it's like and again i've it's been getting flooded problem. with dms and it's been like it's been both overwhelming and because it's exhausting at scale but it's also necessary and so that's been the thing that's also been grading on my mental health a little bit which i talked about in the video the the idea of it is exhausting but it's also exhausting because again uh, it, it ends up putting some of the responsibility on us as uh, people who are yeah. black or people who are other in any way it ends up but the thing is but we can't shirk that even though it shouldn't have to be our responsibility we can't shirk that because we don't we don't have the option we don't have the option because the consequences of doing so are too great which is another way that privilege presents itself because the thing is and i i struggle with the word privileged myself because again for somebody who might be like a 20 something year old like you know white kid whether they're conservative or liberal to then look at my money look at like okay you live in a nice house you have nice things you make multiple six figures a year and i'm poor you're privileged and it's like so you are diminishing all the work and all the accomplishments things i did for us because you're comparing your circumstances to mine and saying it'd be a privilege or it'd be great to have that but the thing is the word privilege is often conflated with um the uh, concept of a luxurious circumstance in some cases because it also sometimes conflates wealth with other forms of privilege but that's also because a lot of people making those assertions at least from my understanding sometimes are looking at people who are successful which are disproportionately white in america and then they're conflating everything that goes with that with privilege without contextualizing here are circumstances that were produced as a consequence of what you did and what you earned and what you worked for here are a set of um, results that were not necessarily um, a matter of your effort or a matter of your choosing. Here are the things that were things that are a consequence of the choices you made that determines aspects of your outcomes, and here are things that didn't determine uh, your outcomes because you had no, or they, t- they determined your outcomes, but they weren't a matter of your control. Here is, for example, comparatively, I am privileged versus my father. My father came to this country with nothing. My father was born in Canal Zone, Panama. 
my father was discriminated against in the military for having an accent and for not uh, being born here and not being American enough and always having to prove himself. To, uh, now, comparatively to my father, I'm absolutely privileged because he didn't ask to be born in Panama. He had no control of that versus me being born in America. I had no control over that. That was a result of his choices. So I had no control over that. My father was born in a time and an era that was much harder for blacks and immigrants than I was and where the limits of his abilities were also proportionate to the access to technology at his time. Because if my father had been born in this time with his mindset and his skill set, he might have he might just be me. You know, I'm Roberto Enrique Blake II. He'd basically be me. <laughs> like, if my father was born at this time mm -hmm. and in this country, he'd be me. If I was born in his time and in his country, I might be him. So that is the difference in privilege in the micro context of that. It doesn't negate his sacrifices, nor does it negate my sacrifices to be where I am. It's just a matter of he did the most he could do with what he had, where he was. And the thing is, what was possible for me was radically different. And the variance for that was the time in which I was born and the place in which I was born. And therein lies our biggest two differences. And so when where it goes different from that is the, if... Um, the fact that um, you might be underclassed or underprivileged or poor is a circumstance that could change over time and could be um, changed more easily than most other things, even if it doesn't seem like that. But I can't change being black. I can't change being a first-generation American. I can't change those things. I can't change having ADHD. I can't change these things about me that our social constructs present disadvantages for that don't exist in natural reality outside of our social fabric. Outside of our social fabric, there's no biological predisposed weakness to being black, you know. There's no biological disadvantage to being black that exists outside of our social framework. None. Mm -hmm. There is no disadvantage to being an immigrant or first generation or speaking uh, a different language or having an accent, there's no biological disadvantage to that that exists outside of our social framework. We manufactured those problems. So circumstances I didn't control that present issues and problems that are not a natural consequence, that is where if that is not true for you, well, you're privileged. And it's again, it's the scale of which, because again, I'm privileged compared to my father, but I'm not com privileged compared to the majority of people in this country because despite the circumstances that were a consequence of my choices, people who choose my career path and career field disproportionately end up where I end up. That's true. Roberto, you are a brilliant person, but I tell you, you want to have a dog walk around behind you and I will folk I my attention is directly on who is that who's that angel back So that there? is so that's Tugboat. That's Tug uh, that's a great dog name. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, no, he's uh, great. Like, um, yeah, I po I post him to Twitter sometimes when people need to feel good. Like, oh, it's <laughs> yeah, Twitter. Yeah, yeah. Roberto, yeah, you're, you're you're you. Oh, sorry, I was gonna say that oh, you're sure. just kind of touching on like survive and thrive. It's not an either or thing. Is mm -hmm. kind of what I hear that like you're saying. You've you found a way to thrive, but that doesn't negate the fact that every that, day you still feel like you have to survive. And it doesn't negate the fact that it doesn't negate the fact that there were so many things beyond my control that could have undermined all of my ability, all of my choices that weren't a matter of my choices and that they are introduced from the outside factors of the framework and the systems that we have that are insidious and sinister in nature. And I have suffered the consequences of those. Uh, there are people who, however, suffer them a lot more than me. And um, because there are things that we talked about earlier, they're tied to the trauma that African Americans have suffered that have been in this country historically under Jim Crow and the ones who are descendants of slaves who experienced that before that and so on and so forth. And also the impact that that's had on them generationally and the fact that how it also affects their internal psychology. The internal psychology that I was raised with was very different even though my father himself suffered prejudice and systemic injustice in this country in a very real and direct way, and the military was very different back then as well, and he actually specifically forbade us to speak Spanish. We couldn't speak Spanish. Our grandparents weren't allowed to speak Spanish to us because he refused to have us be disadvantaged by an accent on top of having foreign names, 
foreign heritage, and being black in America, he said, that's one more disadvantage too far. Mm-hmm. I'm not, it's, it's, and, and I agree. one that was in his control to, to uh, navigate. Exactly. And for him as a proud, a very proud man, like pride is probably one of the ma- biggest characteristics I would attribute to my father. Um, the, um, to go there, oh, that had to hurt. Like, yeah. Uh, yeah. that had to hurt. And so, um, and to the ridicule that he got from his uh, peer group in his community for that, it was just horrific. And so that's a, but that was a sacrifice he made to say you will now not have one more strike against you because here's the long freaking list. Yeah, it's he sounds like one of those dads that uh, loves you. <laughs> yes, but it like I didn't fully always appreciate it at the time because oh, you can't. Who could? He initially he didn't like most people who are black in America grow up with uh, um, twice as hard, half as much. Yeah. It might as well be stamped on your birth certificate, which is part of the insidious nature of the uh, the system. However, having my father might as well have literally, in this case, he was a Marine. It's like he practically was a drill sergeant. <laughs> having yeah. my drill sergeant father, oh, no, no, no. It's not twice as hard, half as much. It's that, oh, you're sick today? Well, you're still 10x. You still got to be 10x. Compared, like, I didn't even know that my standards that I was raised with were so ridiculous until I started experiencing other people because there was no room for anything. So you were 24. (laughs) Basically there was no room for anything but perfection. There was no room to be anything but the best at everything. There was no getting less than an A. There was no misspeaking or mispronouncing a word. Yikes. There was no being, I naturally was nearsighted and also um, initially was a little bow legged as a kid and a club foot. Nope. Stand up straight. Stop being clumsy. Da, da, and Not it was a, today. like the, the, the things that I was raised with by today's standards, everybody would call probably abuse. <laughs> the, the, like, but the, I can't argue with the results. I would argue that I feel that in hindsight everyone thinks they can do it better I would argue that I could have figured out a better way to produce those results with less abuse but I digress my point but is your dad may have done that already too your dad may have improved the model a little bit he might have like and as because I got I did, looked at and I'm still like I got it figured out and I I know my grandfathers Steve and I have talked about it terrible yeah. grandfathers piece of shit grandfathers <laughs> Yeah, Abusive. no, so I agree. So it's like, okay, uh, better with every version, right? Roberto Enrique Blake III will be uh, the our, my, our masterpiece. The yeah. That will be, when that happens, that will be our masterpiece. That's that will the be final the Pokemon. Col- uh. that, will be the, that will be the culmination of our 100-year plan and everything like that. The grand plan of the Sith will okay. finally be realized. Dude, given the, <laughs> given the direction the world is going, that's perfect. That's the most recent, yeah. the last model, the world will be exploded. <laughs> So, yeah, also, right. okay. Right. Also, yeah. sh- uh, shit. Grandpas was our first uh, group name. <laughs> All right. Um, so listen, we're hitting the two. Yeah, it hour. was. It was. Sorry. We're hitting the two-hour mark of the podcast. There is one thing I do so, have to please, cover in yeah, that. Please, from the points please, please. Yes. So we 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 have a we have this really great dovetail, and then I do want to spend just a little bit more time with you. I know we've got a super super long thing, but I want to talk to you guys more, and I'm having so much fun with you guys. But like, I think I cannot do our topic justice without uh, no pun intended there without um talking about the casual weaponization of privilege now that we've identified what it is now that because again the thing that people struggle to identify is well what would make somebody privileged and it really comes down to knowing and having and whether you're aware of it or not of like having advantages or expectations or things that were not merited that are different than what everyone else experiences or what a specific group experiences. It's like, and it can be relative. It is not blanket. It is contextual. Like most of what we talked about, it's nuanced. But here's a very clear cut example of the weaponization of privilege in the form of abuse rather than neglect. Because I think most of it is neglect, to be frank. I think in the in the general society, it's neglect. In the power structures, it's abuse and neglect. But for the casual, so. well-meaning, lawful, good people, well, their form of it is neglect, and mm-hmm. it's, 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 it's less overt, but it's also sinister. But here's where it's abuse in the casual, everyday person. Um, Amy Cooper versus Christian Cooper, um, or what we affectionately call the Central Park Karen. Like, it's, it's so crazy that they got married after that. 
<laughs> for the people who don't and know, she, they did she not. took his name. <laughs> Love me. Love yeah. So, like, oh, this is Amy Cooper. This is Christian Cooper. No relation. <laughs> um, you know, um, um, Tiny Toon Adventures reference for anybody in the audience. But like, uh, that's not hashtag old gang. Um, <laughs> we love the, Tiny uh, Toons here. <laughs> yeah, but the uh, so with Amy Cooper. Um, she was being, um, you know, she was being rightfully criticized for walking her dog without a leash in Central Park, which is the law. And uh, it was being done by um, a black man, uh, Christian Cooper. Now, Amy, and, this, and the thing is, in this case, we're not being casually racist and, um, you know, weaponizing privilege because we're not mentioning their race for the sake of doing it. It's actually contextual to this story. And when people tell stories about people and they go, oh, my black friend, so-and-so, that is a form of casual racism that people don't think about. Because if it adds no value to the story, why bring it up? The, um, but in this case, it does add value to the story. So Amy, who is white, Christian, who is black, he rightfully tells her to be in compliance with the law and that she can't have her dog off her leash like that. She starts arguing and yelling with him. He's filming this situation, and she starts practically strangling her dog as she calls the police on him and then proceeds to act distressed and act like she's under attack and threat and specifically calls out that it's an African-American male. She knows, and she cannot be so naive and cannot be a grown-ass adult and not know what telling the police that means and not know what it means to Mr. Cooper here and that that is in itself a threat and that she knows that for inconvenience and chastising her, she is willing to endanger his life in an interaction with law enforcement. Because, again, there is no way in 2020 she is ignorant to what it means to call the police, act distressed as a white woman, and um, say that you feel threatened and in danger from an African American right. male. Right. It's like when you're on the phone. It's like hit one if you're or press two if you're being attacked by a black male. You know, press three if yeah. it's you know. It's like you know, there is. It's an emergency yeah. line so that they'll hurry the, up and get. She to you. cannot get a pass on intentions here. Right. There's no good intentions. Right. She's not acting in. There's no good faith here. Um, do I feel she's sincerely distressed? She might be sincerely distressed. Do I feel she has any? fear for her life or reason to do so to fear for her life no because if you did fear for your life you would remove yourself from that situation you're not you would distance yourself from that situation no reasonable person who genuinely says just like the people who call the cops and say oh is this person supposed to be in my building or what elevator or where do you live or whatever like if you genuinely thought that person was a threat you wouldn't sit there within three feet of them and also you wouldn't feel so comfortable that you can this person who you think is a criminal and a threat this person who you think could have ill intentions and do violence, you're going to sit there and watch them like a hawk and be in their presence while you wait for the police. With zero defense and just a phone. With zero yeah. defense. That is the most ridiculous, absurd, idiotic, illogical, irrational, backwards, dumbass thing that anybody could do if they want to say that they genuinely were concerned and had um, reasonable fear. And it's like, if you had reasonable fear, if your actual fight or flight response was, tra was triggered, you'd be doing something really different. Oh, yeah. The fact that we will entertain any kind of benefit of the doubt for that itself is a form of privilege because we're assigning to them benefit of the doubt that we would never assign in any situation if we literally boil it down to its facts. Mm -hmm. And that's the one, one of those rare situations to the point we made earlier about well, facts and feelings. And also, I mean, I just don't know that it's an excuse, even if it was the case. If she felt fear, I don't care necessarily about, like, the emotional state. She was being a terrible person. Correct. And she was being racist, and she was knowingly yes. being racist. So it's like, Knowingly yeah, being are, racist. Yeah, even if you, even if there, is, I don't know how people react to different things. And as somebody who gets scared, may uh freeze some people may run i don't know what her inner workings are but i do look at somebody's actions and go okay you seem to be being a terrible person and then when you have other people all of a sudden pop up in her defense and go whoa 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 that's not that's not really what was going on 
she was just they start making these like excuses, excuses for her and because then, they're internalizing their own complicity exactly. and, and they're internalizing the i would be doing i'd be doing that and i don't want to be labeled as a bad person or if i behave that way i don't what they're internalizing it and they're projecting and as a result of projecting and identifying with her they're casting the her in the role of innocence because they want to be given benefit of the doubt for that they are not identifying with the victim they can't relate to the victim they well, are yeah. not and they get to uh, they get to go, well I'm look I'm just waiting for all the facts because we don't know the full story we don't really get <laughs> like you know and that whole thing and then you're like wait you're they all, would you're not just behave not saying anything you're just they not don't and we do got that. we got the whole story they from don't do the clip. that they yeah. don't respond to they don't respond the same way to that when both parties are white or when both parties are yep. their gender because they can identify with that and so now they require no imagination no empathy to superimpose themselves right. in the role of the victim right. if you cannot superimpose yourself in the role of the victim then you don't do that and you don't empathize with that person you superimpose yourself in the role of the person that you most identify right. with, not the person who's the most correct, not the person who is most deserving, not the person who has been wrong. The person that you identify with the well, most is who you then superimpose yourself over, and then you start to then apply the golden rule to, in their situation, here's how I would want to be treated, mm -hmm. and you will do that in a way that favors you. That's privilege, and it's the weaponization of privilege. And so there's that. Now let's compare what happened with Mr. Cooper and with Amy here to the vigilantes who attacked me. When confronted with me, they found no evidence of me having any kind of gun or any kind of weapon. They had no means of confirming my identity as a shooter. And when I confronted them, I said just, and when they were beating me and when I could, when it was getting harder to defend myself, when they started holding me down and stuff like that, when they got me on the ground, all those things, I kept saying, just call the cops. Someone who is a criminal doesn't beg and plead right. for you to call the police. A black man doesn't call, beg for you to call the police if he's guilty. That makes no rational, logical, reasonable sense. And therefore, if you have the, if you believe that, hey, this person might be in possession of a firearm and has already discharged it and committed a crime, even in numbers, yeah, don't approach that person. Right. And, if you believe that and then you find no evidence of that, Arkham's Razor says the most logical explanation is not that this person ditched the gun, but that this person never had one. And so this person, Arkham's Razor also say, gee, a person crying out for the police probably didn't do anything wrong. A person crying out for the police, maybe what I should do or maybe the appropriate thing is we have the guy. He's not a threat. If we want justice or if we want him held accountable we call the police ourselves and we let the police take care of him and we hand him over. But that's logical that's what, thinking. That's just logical thinking. Like that, <laughs> But what people do, like I said earlier, remember earlier at the top of the program where I said, we have these emotional ideas and responses and all we do is come up with reasons and logic and rationalizations to allow for those things, to justify those things so that we can say we're right. And then we try to convince as many people as possible that that is also correct. And if and if the problem in the insidious nature of our social framework and of white privilege is that if you are white and the person who is um, not the victim, if the person who is the abuser in that situation is white and you can come up with a logical rationalization for that person that you've superimposed yourself on because you relate to them. The problem is that you also make up the majority of the population. And so if there is not more conditioned empathy in people to be able to superimpose themselves on everybody and anybody and say who's right and who's wrong and say see it from the perspective of the victim and come to a rational, a truly objectively rational conclusion, not an emotional one that you've rationalized, then see the problem becomes that, and the reason that, um, injustice persist is because the privilege that comes from this separation exists the hmm i am that person and not this person so i have to come up with a defense for that person because i'm defending myself now and then the thing is you're not an individual you're the majority and so if you can make that rationalization work you'll have enough support for it and there's no reason to there's no reason to question it, and there's no reason to change it. If enough people agree with you, and you hold the majority of power within every institution, why would you change it? The, uh, right. 
I think the the pursuit of like internalizing empathy to the point of it being able to be a reaction a hundred percent of the time or a knee jerk reaction I don't know is necessarily possible because of the way our brains work or a but default. I think, yeah, I think even then though the 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 work that you have to put in to be able to feel empathy is in and of itself uh, it's it's a decades long battle for some people a lifelong battle for some people depending on what their their upbringing is and so it's like we yeah, can't leave I mean, that to chance we can't leave that to chance and yeah, there are a lot of people great point yeah and we can't and the thing is when you say that people are then very fearful and I understand why but here's the thing we if we already agree and the problem is that we don't people only publicly sometimes agree for reasons but if we agree that things need to change the best framework that we have to change it is the education system because 95 percent of the population goes through public school system, which means you have to change the education around the history of blacks in America, of slaves in America, of women's suffrage, of uh, immigrants and immigration, of, um, of um, systems of racism, of oppression. We have to literally hold up the ugly underbelly of this country and of the world at large and tell the true history as unflattering and unfavoring as it may be, not for the purposes of conditioning crippling white guilt but objectivity because mm -hmm. the fear and the counter reaction to this is you want people to not have pride in their white identity you want people to suffer the uh and stagnate from white guilt because you need them to lose in order to win because you aren't good enough on your own and that's the pushback that's the pushback that's the argument that's made and that's not the argument i'm making i'm making the argument for if presented with objectivity and uh, and a balanced set of of, um, of facts and reality and presented in a way with the purpose of allowing people to come to what would be natural conclusions when you don't try to influence the outcome, then guess what? We will have a better and much more well-rounded and thoughtful and conscientious and empathetic and kind society. And we do it by starting at that level and just by also introducing critical thinking and stop the regurgitating of facts and that bullshit. And if we also, again, align people to their natural skills, they also stop suffering from scarcity, which means they stop comparing themselves and they stop feeling like in order to win, other people have to lose. And they start realizing that the collaborative and collective power that people have, if their individual potential is monetized, then your weakest link is still a goddamn gladiator. I, uh, wow. Great stuff, man. Amazing. I think Amazing stuff. On the point that you were um, talking about with like the white guilt stuff, I feel like maybe this is wrong, but in my experience, guilt and in, in what I've learned, guilt itself is not necessarily a useful or productive uh, No, I agree with that. That's why I'm yeah. against that. And I think that when you're talking about you know the purpose of educating people to be to produce white guilt i actually think it would produce a lot less white guilt because when in my experience when i feel quote unquote white guilt it's because i am becoming inundated uh and overwhelmed with information that i didn't previously have that might be emotional or it might be historical and as a result i'm shocked and i i feel and i all of a sudden i just go into this mode of that's like i don't think productive to anybody and i think people but if introduced thoughtfully it. Yeah, and if, if it was a gradual situation with youth and where it was sort of like normalized, then yeah, I think we, you'd probably get people who are more excited to implement actual change. Yeah, that's a great, I think you're totally right. And to your point, the way that my parents, because also they didn't leave it the chance to the school system to educate me and to educate me about history and heritage and in the world. And even though we had, in, at least until I moved into the public, public, public education system, the first few years I was in the military's education system, which is a little bit different. And one, the standard for that is what would be the public school systems magnet program, and I was in the magnet program for that nice. um, because I scored very high in IQ testing as a child, and so they did that appropriately. They didn't skip you grades initially back then. They just um, started to uh, because they borrowed from foreign education systems where they basically created these Mm, we we understand people of higher aptitudes or learning capabilities and so on yeah. and so forth, and we create um, classes for the um, you know the people who might move a little faster, right? Instead of skipping them a grade, we actually just put all of the um, the uh, magnet school or gifted program children together, right? So 
there was that, but then we were also being taught to be cultural chameleons and to learn and to um, absorb other people's history and culture because we are ambassadors of America. Because as a military family, you're expected that you will travel the world and that you will go to a place that's not your own and you have to be able to absorb history and language and um, culture and context and nuance and gestures and all these things and you have to also be able to read those things well. And so you're put through a very different um, thought process and uh, a very different decision making rubric and again you're also taught more of the ability again to superimpose yourself onto another person uh, because that is essential to your role of being in a military family and I say all that to say that when you go to the public education system it's nothing like that and the, my parents didn't leave it to chance that the public education system would teach me about black history teach you about teach me about my history teach me about my heritage teach me about anything. My parents had also though, uh, as uh, immigrants, they had a cultural upbringing that education is the out for immigrants, so they actually also heavily prioritize it in that way. And why I'm saying that is to say this, even racism and um, you know the black experience was introduced to me incrementally in a way, especially since my parents identified me to be a very sensitive child um, and a very artistic child and had deep emotions. And because they also got me tested and realized that I had ADHD and they started learning and educating themselves about it, they, even with that, they didn't make me feel like a freak either. They made it a strength and not a weakness and they trained me how wow. to use it. And so again, what my parents did was anything that should be a liability to me they incrementally introduced it in such a way as to not be traumatic and not to flood and overwhelm me, not to weaken and lower my self-esteem, but wow. to, in a way, to make me work with it and to utilize it and to harness it and to internalize it only for the purposes of productivity, awareness, and protection, wow. and to understand myself and not to judge myself, but to understand. and. That's where I come back to this whole, we've got to diagnose and prescribe instead of evaluate and say, you suck, you're good, you're more, you're less. We have to see, we have to help people understand what they are and how to make the most of it and also acknowledge what's wonderful about where they are, but also make sure that they're aware of what the consequences are for them and how best to navigate them. It's wow. like the, the connecting factor of everything that we've talked about is thoughtfulness. It's thoughtfulness for yourself, who you are on the inside. It's thoughtfulness in, in connection to your fellow man. No, it's it's all of it. It's seven layers of, thi like you said, and critical thinking, but emotional critical thinking and the, as well. Again, you didn't my hear me weird, too, but I just said, no, it's not. <laughs> <laughs> my, my, weird, uh, my weird brain sees all these interconnecting dots because for all the threads and all the tangents, you see all the internet, like when, when I've done it, you can see that none of it was me just changing subjects and going to, no, I see the relationship between all of those from the top down and also from the bottom up and from the inside out. That's and, what I've enjoyed about this is watching how your, uh, but, your brain, uh, but I also know, but I also know I'm atypical neurologically. I also know that I'm atypical in many other ways. And so knowing that, I don't have and don't project that expectation to see that onto everyone else. Yeah, that makes sense. It takes a second. Well, wow, what an incredible note, damn person you are. Can you, can we be very good uh, friends, please? Yeah, man. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. <laughs> when it's possible to hang out, I would like to do that. Oh, one hundred percent. Even as uh, yeah. as friends, I would ha even yeah, hang no, out with other I, friends. I, Who knows? Yeah, no, I would love when the world isn't burning down to get a beer. <laughs> Please. Well, let's let's wrap this up. I think we're we're pretty pretty good on stuff. But um, dude, wow, man, this is great. This dude. is you maybe came my favorite episode prepared. of the podcast we've ever done because it's Roberto. So... You came you yeah. came more prepared for this podcast than we have ever come for anything <laughs> involving our business. <laughs> you nailed it. Yeah, we might be hiring you to help us with our business also. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. dude happy to do it like you know we can definitely talk about that another time we can even like again you guys ever want to hang out whether you want to shoot the shit on something much lighter and please god let's shoot the shit on something lighter sometime <laughs> um or you want to talk about youtuber -y stuff and everything like that i'm i'm more than happy to come back and i really appreciate you um one i appreciate all of you as humans and i appreciate you guys listening and being thoughtful and giving me your time and uh also i appreciate your thoughts and where you interjected and i love the conversation 
I know I carried a lot of it and I know I said a lot, but uh, um, I really am thankful for our time together. I'm thankful for the audience for giving me a chance and for listening. Thanks, wow. Man. I'm thankful you carried Thanks, it. Thanks, Roberto. Uh, yeah, man. Yeah, what it, was, a, it was wonderful. Absolutely enlightened, and I feel energized by everything that you've said, Roberto. You're an amazing energized, person. Energized, yeah. For sure. It's nourishing, because uh, it's nice, because it's also it's the thing brain that food. As, yeah, it's brain food, and it's also what everyone is, like, after this is done, I'm still going to be thinking about it, and it's to. nice to feel like I don't have all these thoughts that I need to get out, uh, and it's nice to, like, work through them with you. Um, and the good news is these problems are solvable. These problems are solvable. There are things we can do today. The things we can do today is, um, one, immediately get justice for George Floyd. Immediately. And justice, unfortunately, for everybody uh, affected by the fallout of this um, that deserves justice. And then beyond that, we have to have reform. We have to pass bipartisan legislation that, um, like Van Jones said, we have to pass bipartisan legislation that eliminates the chokehold, that raises the standards for who can become a cop, and raises the consequences for when there's abuses of power within our police system, and we have to reevaluate our police unions. And then um, beyond that, we need to um, really take a hard look beyond that at... Um, making people whole who have suffered injustices we need to make it we have, we need to do some tort reform we need to look at when injustices happen especially racial injustices whether it's within the police department whether it's it's within medical we need citizens to be able to have the ability to seek recompense financially uh through lawsuits it's almost impossible to sue a police department we need to make that not the case because great power great responsibility and consequences when we know you're going to get your pockets hit up you make less mistakes so we need those consequences in place for people with power and uh and beyond that we have to hold our leaders responsible for their rhetoric yeah agreed um, yep, on all of it. Well, we got we to have a leader before we can hold him responsible. <laughs> well, there is that. <laughs> you, 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 uh, burn. Shut your mouth. So, uh, burn. so Hoss, Roberto, yes. Hoss, burn. Where, a rare moment where we make fun of Trump. Uh, Roberto, where can people <laughs> yes, find you? That's what I was going to say. Uh, so people can find me at Roberto Blake in all social medias. Uh, you can find me on YouTube at youtube.com slash Roberto Blake 2. If you like businessy stuff and you're a creative type person, you know, you're a freaking nature like me and you want some money in your pocket, so you can have follow you, uh, me over th- have you ever read start with why yes by simon sinek it's is yeah. on the list of the hundreds upon hundreds of books on the shelf and it nice. is uh one of my favorites i love it all right cool that's my final question and we're out i'm out Bye. <laughs> i'm done i get, i got it so i want to be able to thank you for everything my friend what a wonderful yeah. podcast this was but i want to um, remind people that there are plenty of places to donate to a lot of wonderful causes for Black Lives Matter, and I'm I'm having trouble locating kind of like a hub though for for. for so th- I I can't remember who someone in Twitter because there were so many retweets started a um, what is that thing Notation is that the app that everyone's using now Notation. Um, Ooh, I don't know. But there's this app that they, someone used to put together a kind of a consolidated list of resources, and it's actively being updated, and it's communal and stuff like that. And oh. I don't remember who shared it and how they titled it, but if you can send co- it to us, we can put it in the. We'll yeah, find a I'll bunch of stuff. And, yeah, we'll fill down. up the description. There is yeah, a site called Black Lives Matters dot c a r r d dot c o. And it, that's one that, that I've been fine. sharing. That one's been going around a lot. I posted yeah. an article to Allure that had, whatever, for whatever reason, it had a bunch of different options. But yeah, the I don't know if that may. Well, we'll figure it out. Whatever. This one says either, it's anyway. constantly. Links being are in updated, the doodly do. But links yeah. are in the doodly do. <laughs> yeah, yeah. links do. in the description. But there's plenty of places and plenty of ways to help. There's petitions and donations and texts and very easy ways to to support and show support for fellow Earthlings and people that you would love to um, enjoy a happier life. So Here's a really good one. Fucking vote. Yes, yes, absolutely. Most importantly, fucking vote. If you live in one of the places where voting has started, um, we're recording this on a Wednesday, but... Voting has started in many places, and if you live- look, if you if you're out there in those streets and you ain't in that voting booth in November, don't make me come find you. Oh, we'll find you. At this point, we will find you because we're sick of this shit and we want it to yep. end. And 
we uh, you know we we need you to vote. We have nothing else to do. We have nothing else to do. (laughs) And there's a pandemic. Don't forget that. But anyway, don't forget that. Roberto, wash your damn hands. Wear a mask. Thank you, my friend. Thank you for doing this. Thank you, thank you. You are an amazing person. And guys, thank you for listening to the podcast. We'll catch you next time on the Valley Cast. Thank you guys so much. Goodbye. Bye.